All right, everyone, welcome to the regular town council meeting, town of Cape Creek, Arizona, Monday, July 19th, 2021. Mr. Arlen, would you lead us in the uh, Pledge of Allegiance? Uh, from the vast audience, I picked you out. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, one God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <clears throat> Brian, is there people looking at us online? Uh, there are. How many you got? Um, we've got five attendees. Five attendees. Okay, I just want to uh, point out something. Uh, Councilman uh, Sova today got emails from me requesting that he uh, purchase gift cards and, and uh, to the tune of three of them for 500 bucks a piece and send them and take pictures of the front and back and send them off to somebody. Uh, that email address is now blocked. I na have now, nor will I ever ask anyone anyone to send me a dang gift card from anywhere so uh if you get that it's a spoof it's a bunch of garbage don't do it um i guess uh if you need if you need emergency health care i understand you can go to a brazo now we had a thing on uh, on thursday and uh, they, i think they were beginning accepting uh patients today they are that's what they said cool. No, I don't think so. They told me a few weeks. Did they tell you a few weeks? Yes. They told me Monday when I asked earlier. Monday. Okay, if if you if don't get sick yet. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So anyway, um, don't don't believe me when I when I tell you everything. All right. Um, call to the public. I bet Mr. Arlen is. Uh, that's is, you, we supposed to have a roll call. Oh, I'm sorry. Roll call. Good grief. Yeah. Thank you. Gosh. Well, it, we hadn't had a meeting in a while. I got confused. <laughs> yeah, right. Ernie, you're getting older. I am getting old. Council Member Royer. Here. Council Member Morris. Present. Council Member McGuire. Present. Vice Mayor Smith. Here. Council Member Diefenderfer. Here. Council Member Sova. Here. Mayor Budge. Oh, uh, here. Now we can do that, right? David Phelps. <clears throat> Hello, this is David Phelps. I um, would like to uh, welcome everybody back, and I would very, like to know. Very soft. I would like to know. Um, I tell you what, I need to get a couple of things together. Can Mr. Arlen go in first place, and I can get this stuff written down, and I can I'll tell get someone's back to talking, mind. but we can't hear. Okay. Uh, He's asked if Mr. Arlen can go and get something together. He's he's trying to get it straightened out. Okay. You want Bruce Arlen to go now? Jane, call Bruce Arlen. <laughs> I'm sorry. Bruce Arlen. Hello, everybody. Hi, Bruce. Um, Bruce Arlen is going to So I handed out. Each one of you has a Maricopa County Planning and Development Department. Have you got a red light in your microphone? Oh, now you do. There we go. <laughs> so everybody, uh, the council has a uh, Maricopa County Planning and Development Department nine sheets, which concerns uh, something that I'm concerned about, which is Maricopa County is speaking with the advertise the billboard lobby in Maricopa County, Phoenix. Uh, and um, they are pushing for a gigantic expansion of a proliferation of billboards, uh, larger ones, most importantly, digital billboards. Okay. And uh, as well as billboards that would be, as my understanding, even closer together in terms of distance from each other. Now, there's a lot of uh, language in their proposals, which uh, uh, tries to, like, you know, any group lobbying tries to mitigate the problem, but they want what they want. And I'm saying that somebody who's a, uh, a founder of Cave Creek dark sky initiative uh, that it would be the wrong thing to do so why am i bringing it up to the council it's maricopa county 
here's what I'm requesting tonight. And time is of, of the essence, frankly. I am asking the council to uh, basically come together as one and essentially compose a letter to Maricopa County on this issue so that Cave Creek as one from uh, our leaders will say, you know, we oppose expanding billboards in Maricopa County. The closest one, my understanding, uh, is the corridor at Carefree Highway and the I-17 starting to go south. But it does affect us. We are in the county. It is more light pollution in a big, big way amongst all the other things that uh, all that kind of stuff will do. A lot of distraction. And I'm asking you to do that. Now, um, Council Member uh, Royer uh, has already written to the county and she already opposes this effort by, by the uh, billboard industry. And I don't know who could do it. Maybe she could do it, you know, compose a letter and hopefully you guys will like the letter. <laughs> Maybe you'll even have some input and you will all sign it. And on behalf of the citizens of Cave Creek, we can at least make a stand and, uh, and oppose this kind of expansion. And that's really all I wanted to say. It's as plain as that. A lot of the information is in the nine pages that I gave everybody. And uh, there's also a meeting. So time is of the essence. My understanding is the July 22nd meeting is now delayed till August 5th. Why? Because there was a lot of pushback by people in the county. And I do believe that the lobby, this is a guess on my part. I do believe that the lobby, billboard lobby is um, reconstituting their arguments. And so maybe they're a little bit on their back heel. I don't know, but I would like to have Cave Creek stand up together. It would be a nice thing. Thank you. Mr. Arlen, whom do we address? It's all on there actually. Um, also, if you do want to do that, I can send you the names of the commissioners. Would you like that? It would be the uh, Board of Supervisors. Okay. It's not the county supervisors, I believe. I think it's the planning and zoning uh, department that's, want, uh, that's uh, uh, conducting the hearings. Mr. Sims, wouldn't they have to go through the supervisor to get that? Get... Their commission has as little power as yours does. It has okay. to go through the supervisor. It would ultimately get to their yes. to, to the county supervisors? Yes. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Yeah. So do you need any information from me regarding that? No, no. And uh, we need to move on. Okay. Um, Mr. Mayor. Question, Mr. Mayor. Uh, we're, we're, we're really not supposed to be dialoguing back and forth. Well, unless this is not me. for Mr. Ireland. Okay. It's for our town attorney. Yes, the sign ordinances, billboard ordinances, et cetera, we have in our town covered by our ordinances would stay in place. What the county does on county property yes. would not affect us no. at all, no. other than if they're lit and it's near our town this is, borders. This is an example. This is an example. I guess you know there was that case that went all the way to the Supreme Court that really makes it difficult. <laughs> these up signs. But in this case, dark skies is something you can do. So you have the power, you can exercise the power. The county can't exercise their power in your jurisdiction. Thank you. Except that. The lights would shine outside of our <laughs> our town properties. I mean, come on! I don't think there would be any harm done in us sending a letter. And I would propose that I'd like to write it and have and our. This is not agendized. We're not really supposed yeah, to be discussing are, it. You're, you're doing that. We're going beyond now. What you can do is to say put it on an agenda. Our next meeting isn't until next month at this time, which is too late. Yeah. So how do we take action, Mr. Sims? Before then, individually, everyone can 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 send a letter to the planning commission and the supervisor. So we can't coordinate a joint effort before next month. You wish to put it on the agenda. You have, that's what you have to do to coordinate. So we have to do it individually. Yeah. Thank you. Now is Mr. Phelps handy?
Yes. Hello, this is David Phelps. Can you hear me? Uh, we cannot hear you. Um, I guess I could call in. Does he have a microphone he needs to turn on? Uh, he is, looks like he's unmuted on his side. Can you hear me now? I'm trying to call in. Okay, he's trying to phone in. I'm, I'm hearing him just a little bit in my headphones. <sighs> Go ahead and uh, go forward with the agenda. I'll try to get a uh, line through to Brian and see if we can't work this out. Sorry for the inconvenience. Okay, he's, he's I think he's gonna try and phone me. Um, okay. Just go ahead and move on with the agenda. Brian, tell him to go ahead and go forward with the agenda. I'm go. I'm okay. I'll just catch up later. He's saying to move forward. Do what? Move, move forward. forward. All right, here we go. Um, there's no town manager here, so I guess we're not having a town manager report. Um, consent agenda, uh, acceptance of deed of gift for 1,413 square foot wide public trail pathway e easement, uh, parcel 211-11-048D. And approval of the June 21st, 2021 regular council meeting minutes. Do we have a motion? So moved. Second. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Ayes clearly have it. General agenda item number one, council approval of engagement letter with Wedbush Securities Incorporated to serve as municipal advisor to the town. Welcome of to the on, on with Enter them. your Under meeting ID. Followed by Pat. Who's doing this one? Our members of council, it will be um, Pat Walker. She'll be on Zoom along with Jim Strickland and Tim Stratton. Enter your participant ID followed by pound. Otherwise, just press pound. Mayor and Council, can you hear me? Mayor and Council? We're not hearing you. Uh, yeah, mine's off mute. I was hearing David Phelps fine. Okay. So something's not turned on in, in Cave Creek. Nope. Hold on, Pat, while we take a few moments to correct our audio. Has someone asked Jim to speak to see if he's coming through? Jim, can you hear me? Nope. I can hear you, Pat. Yeah. Uh, yeah, no, he's not coming yeah, through either. No, nobody is. Nod your head, yes, if you can hear me. Okay. Oh, we got a lot of nodding. Well, we got it one way. Now, let me tell you what you're going to say. <laughs> Hold up a piece of paper. Oh. <laughs> you can, oh, they can hear each other. Oh, <clears throat> wow, well, that's interesting. Uh, hey. Can you hear me? This is David. Why? Well, I, I see Jim is muted. This here. is getting yep. really kind of scary. Yeah, but he it wasn't. He he unmuted and tried to talk and didn't okay. work. Okay, I can hear you, David. Well, then I'm having the meeting with the people I really need to talk to. <laughs> oh. We all get so self-conscious when this technology doesn't work, and normally it's the technology. <laughs> uh, um, I think it's on the bottom. Six, six. Check on the bottom. Yeah. Yeah. Six, six, zero, six. No, that's, that's not No, that is, that is the one. That is it? Yep. Yeah. 
What's that? Yes, it'd be one at a time. Can, it, can any of you walk like Charlie Chaplin? <laughs> we, would, we would have to do a conference call to them. Okay. So we have a few more numbers, so we'll do the conference. Yes, we can do that. Yeah. We'll take five minutes. Yeah, I, I'm, I've been asked uh, uh, for us to take a five minute break while they try and get this under control. So I think that's, uh, we'll recess for five minutes. So I've got my phone on as well, but I don't want to, Charlie Chaplin I don't want to bring it up because I'm afraid of the feedback effect. Right. I think the feedback would, would be bad if you have that up. And yeah. Yeah. I've made that big mistake before, but I, I can't get Brian to give me a sign on the on the screen here that he sees me called in. Yeah, we can see that you're called in talking, so it's on their end, I think. Okay. And you were on before. When you were on the computer, I could hear you. Interesting. Yes, there is. Yes, there is. Well, I, I must still be on the computer. Brian hasn't shut me off of the computer. Is that what's going on? Must be. If you hang up, you're still on, right? Okay, I just hung up. Okay, we still on. Okay. Okay. Amazing stuff. So what are you We're going into orbit. Oh, well, you your pay's being cut. Oh, that's fine. Uh, Jane just told me I had my mask on backwards. <laughs> and can we trust anything you say with the mask? <laughs> Oh, <laughs> you know, they got new ones that are small. Yeah, I know. They go over your ears, so you don't have to hear anything you don't like. <laughs> Pat, does Michelle, Michelle work with you? Zoom is not working. Is that our Michelle? problem? Zoom is working. Well, she was, well the, 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 the video, but not the audio. Yeah, well, they apparently. Every one of those so all out. Out. So yes. it's, uh, it's not going to be a <laughs> Okay. Um. Phone's ringing. That means it's at least hooked up. You got to do a You got to do the uh, uh, they could each call one of our cell phones and then we could just put them in. Well, we're actually, we'll save time if we don't get any counsel from people to make decisions based on what is already written for us. Can't do that. Oh, can't do that? No, I have questions. I've only got what, eight here. Eight questions? Yeah. One. I only have. Sorry, I've got three, maybe three or four. But I'm sure mine are more important. To Jim, yours, and yours are probably trivial. Yours are, going to be yours are trivial yours detail. Are more open ended than mine. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I can. I'm afraid I'm going to have feedback, though. Well, that's how Congress does it. Or reporters do it. Um, did you click on attendees or panelists? Because it looks like you're logged in as an attendee. Yeah, you put it on speaker and then just put it by a microphone. That should... Just do a three-way call. 
I just love modern technology. It looks similar to me. It's kind of like Brian sent me a phone number to call, and I called that phone number. And I talked to Tim. Okay. Can I clicked on the email that Brian sent us. Yeah, no, I did the same. And that's how I got where you are. But Tim somehow is on the attendees list or was on the attendees list. Hmm. Yeah, you're not on the attendees list anymore, Tim. Uh, is this Brian? Tim got the email like we did. <clears throat> Tim, I think your feedback. Okay. Okay. Let's go. This would be feedback, Brian. It's just going to work. It's going to feedback. Okay. What if we just do an iPhone? Yeah. And call those two numbers and talk on the iPhone and put the iPhone in the microphone. Just do a three way call on the iPhone. We can do it that way. Yeah. So why don't we just call Patton? And do we have their numbers? We'll have to do the same with the show. Yeah. And just put it on the microphone. <clears throat> I can hear you, Tim. Feedback. If, they, That's we're doing if the same thing the person now. who's called in will be muted on their side, they can hear. I can hear you, Tim. I was on mute on my call. Oh, okay. Yeah, so on my, on my calendar invite, I have a list of the horses. Yes. Cat Walker, who okay. Tim Strickland, click to join. Did you guys hear that? If you guys mute your Zoom call, I think that should work. click on that, it doesn't seem like I can hear it. Is that how you got in? Yes, I clicked on it. So did Pat. Okay, so if I click on it, it should take me there. Every time we do this, we're going to take feedback. They have to get off their ears. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, if, if, are you guys muted your Zoom calls by chance? You are? Okay, here, one. Okay. It didn't give me an option. For an option. Okay. We're going to kill this conference line. We're going to try to redo the Zoom. Oh, yeah.
<laughs> we're going to kill this conference line and we're actually going to restart the Zoom up again and see if that resets the system. So we're just getting too much feedback. So Brian will probably kill the Zoom. Okay. 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 Uh, what we're going to do now is uh, we're going to go ahead and, and uh, come back to that. They're going to try and get the technical issues solved. And we will go to the uh, uh, agenda item number five, which is presentation to council, the quarterly utility report. Sean got laryngitis. Mayor Bunch, hmm? would you notify the public that we may also, they may also lose the Zoom feed. Yeah, you're, you're, and uh, then it'll come back. Up. Right, you're apt to lose the Zoom feed. We're going to, they're going to shut the system down and come back. So we're going to get the uh, quarterly report while this is going on so we can move on, move forward this evening. This is presentation only, no public Presentation only. There's no public comment on this. Uh, uh, will we have, will, when you shut it down, were we going to lose the, uh, the, uh, the copy that we're making of, of the meeting. We lose the video, but the audio that's being recorded at James. So, so when, when, if they come back to the, to the town website and want to see what Sean had to say this evening, yeah. will they, will they be able to do that? We will include the audio in the video that gets put on the YouTube. Okay. So it will be available. It will be available. Okay. All right. Well, you're doing that, Brian. Can you pull up the presentation or not? Uh, Do I crash you? <laughs> we just all along the paper. Okay, you get your paper, and I guess we can get it up. So, well, thank you, uh, Mayor and Council. Uh, uh, we're, it's, we're time due for our quarterly utility report, so that's what the, uh, the action item is tonight, which is more just uh, again information only. So, we're trying to uh, look at providing you uh, information in different ways uh, to give you ideas of what's going on in the system. The first slide is our, um, it's entitled Cave Creek Water uh, Treatment. That's actually the flows that come out of our water treatment plant that we deliver from um, the water treatment plant to our NERI facility that then gets distributed through the, the system. You can see that we've overlaid the uh, 2019, 2020, and the 2021 to date <laughs> flows. So you can see the trend, we're actually trending up a little bit in June in 2021. Uh, we had a little bit of a spike in 2019, and then obviously with COVID being a strange year, we typically would see uh, a, a peak towards the end of the summer. We've, we've uh, maxed out our, uh, we've, we've hit our max day peak, but then the max month actually usually occurs a little bit later in the summer. So we're curious with this trend that we're seeing how much water consumption we will see through the, through the end of the summer. It, it has been a little exceptionally warm. It has cooled off though, um, but as you can see the red trend there, uh, we are going up a little bit. The next slide is uh, more related to billing. It's, it's entitled Cave Creek uh, CAP Water Treatment. It's consumption totals as billed through the system is what we've done here. Uh, so you can see that it's sort of a, a grass next to each other. Uh, the 2019 data is the blue. Uh, 2020 data, which we have full years for, um, uh, is red. And then we have yellow, which is the 2021 year to date. So this is just a different way of looking at it. It's also in, instead of million gallons of treated water, it's actually acre feet per month that we have uh, sent out. And this is coming from our uh, Cassell billing system. So we do a report at the end of the month to see where we are in, in billings out into the system. You can see, uh, similar to the water production, uh, the June data set is a little bit above the pre prior years. So uh, we're interested to see if that continues uh, through the rest of the summer. Sean, would, would you compare yeah. that uh, those numbers to our uh, typical 2,100 acre foot uh, purchases from CAP? Uh, uh, what, what, so, what's the 800 or 750 acre feet difference? So this is just um, billings within Cape Creek. It does not include the uh, billings to Desert Hills that are sent to Desert Hills or with Rancho oh. Mignano. So that's why the numbers look a little little odd when you look at it again. Uh, as Councilmember Morse brought up, um, we typically are ordering about 21 acre, 2100 acre feet of CAP water a year. And of that, uh, in total, it's been about 1,500 goes to the Cave Creek system, which is our uh, Cave Creek and the, the Carefree customers directly connected to our system. A little bit of the water is sent to Ranch Mignana, and the rest is sent to Desert Hills. So it's you have to look at it and how you're look. Uh, in this case, it's just the billings that we're looking at. So our goal is to really try and get down to a, a non-revenue number, which is really you know uh, as a, as a uh, state water provider, we're, we're mandated to actually have a. Uh, a loss, let's call it the non-revenue loss not accounted for water. So we're looking at different ways to, to skin that data set to, to let us find out where we're deficient and where we can do better. 
The next one is actually, uh, it's in cap, in, entitled Cape Creek CAP Water Treatment. It's really the, this is the billings to Desert Hills. So as you can see, uh, again, it's the stack graphs again, uh, 2019, 2020, we have the full year four, and 2021 is the yellow. Um, so in actual deliveries to Desert Hills, we're a little bit behind the schedule from last year. Last year, we actually had, uh, middle of summer, we actually had one of the wells go down. So uh, that sort of anticipated a little bit. So it's ironic that we're getting a little bit more consumption in the Cave Creek water system, uh, but uh, actual billings out to Desert Hills, or uh, extra water we're sending to Desert Hills has actually dropped a little bit since last year. We do anticipate overall, um, if you look back more than 10 years, the typical allocation we've been giving to Desert Hills around the amount of water we've had to supplement out there has been about 400 acre feet. Last two years has been creeping above 600 acre feet. This year, overall projection, we're thinking about 600, we'll end up around 650 acre feet of water that we're sending out to Desert Hills. And that's largely due to the drop in the, uh, the well production in that area. Sean, do we expect that to continue? Do we have reason to think that that will uh, be reduced or increased? Yes, Mayor and Councilmember uh, uh, McGuire, we don't uh, anticipate, from our understanding, the geology out in Desert Hills, is a, it's a shallow sub-basing on its own. So as the water table drops out in that area, the water production actually drops faster. Um, it's not being recharged and it's basically its own little bathtub in effect. So this is why one of the actions tonight is talking about uh, CAP renewable uh, water allocation, although not as, as secure as the, the town's of I water. So it's getting some water resources for Desert Hills while we still run that system. Thank are, you. Are, are we still issuing, issuing well served letters in Desert Hills? At this point, we are. The, the, the current What's the ETA policy? on the water policy? We've got a draft internally. I was actually talking with uh, our uh, town's attorney tonight, so we're going to talk internally and get that routed back around to staff. We, so we, we have a policy. We owe you more than and Michelle is working on that. Yeah. So Looks we, like the sooner the better. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So our next chart is our uh, entitled Cave Creek Water Ranch Monthly Flows. This is the effluent that actually is uh, treated and uh, then sent back up. Uh, we, we measure this at the, the, um, the back end meter, uh, the, the effluent meter at our water uh, ranch, our wastewater treatment plant. What's interesting, you can see uh, that uh, when the 2020 trend is we're, we're way below the typical average which were sort of surprises us because we, we did see after the COVID restrictions were restricted or released uh, a, a bit of a, a bump in March, but then it's dropped back down and we're below average. So we're not really sure we're, just, we're watching that trend. It, the struggle with that is that the, the plant in the summertime is it's low flow. So there's less flows coming in, but there's actually less nutrients for the biological treatment. So it becomes a struggle for our staff to actually keep the plant running. So. We sometimes, it's the terminology we use, we have to feed the bugs during the summertime to keep them alive. <laughs> so we, we actually have to give them material to consume so that they're ready for this, the fall, which we know the fall will increase. And then obviously our delivery to Rancho Mignano is very important to us. So the next couple of graphs are talking about that delivery. Uh, this is the, the uh, total deliveries uh, in acre feet that have been uh, sent to Ranch Mignana. Again, uh, we're trying to give you a pers historical perspective by doing 2019, 2020, and 2021 to year to date. We're a little bit below um, our typical average being sent up there. And that's partly because the, the, um, the effluent values have gone down and they haven't been requesting as much water from us uh, to make up. So the summertime is usually when they, they, because of evaporation loss on the ponds, when we usually actually get uh, larger water orders from them. So that may change as the summer continues. Uh, the next one is trying to break down, just uh, again looking at Rancho Mignana, is the deliveries. And this is just year to date, trying to break down so council is aware. Uh, again, we only started in May of actually uh, delivering raw cap water up the pipeline to them. Uh, you can see that, um, the red uh, bar graph is the uh, amount of effluent sent from our, ran our water ranch. And then, our, our, sorry, uh, the water treatment plant reclaimed water. That's effectively the, the processed water uh, from the uh, water treatment plant. Instead of us sending it down the sewer, we send it up to Rancho Mignana. And then uh, the uh, wastewater, 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 wastewater is the blue on the bottom. And you can see that dropping down. So as our water production increases during the summertime, we do generate more reclaimed, what we call reclaimed water from the, the uh, wastewater treatment plant. And that's just inherent in the process. The staff are trying to optimize that. We're looking at different ways. We're trying to run the pulp membrane uh, system as, as uh, efficiently as we can. 
those two trailers though only produce um, uh, two million gallons a day, so we're above that type of demand. So we have to run the old Trident filters, and they're uh, more inefficient. So we're looking at ways we can optimize that system. Though we'll continuing to look at that. The last chart on the Rancho Mignona Golf Course is just uh, well, she's just one more table for that is uh, uh, deliveries, and uh, uh, this is an attempt to try and uh, uh, give council again another. Uh, uh, look at what we call the non-revenue water for that system um, and the next chart gives you some more tabulated uh, information on that So when we say the top the blue chart is the town meter readings That's the combination of the meters. So that's our effluent meter at the, the uh, wastewater treatment plant It's the reclaimed uh, process water at the water treatment plant and in the raw cap meter so as you can see in 20 and it's not a full year comparison you can see 2021 is just year to date but we send a lot of water up there, and the way the contract is written is that they bill for the water that is consumed out of the lake, not as what we deliver to them. So in 2019, there's a total of 189 acre feet of non-revenue water. 2020, that dropped a little bit. Uh, and uh, we're at 64 acre feet right now. Uh, the summertime is usually, uh, uh, there's a lot of evaporative loss, but then in the wintertime is actually a lot of overflow from the lake system. And the table in the next, uh, Sean, slide helps explain that. on that one. Are we working on on uh, trying to get credit for what goes into the creek? That uh... that's actually something I do want to work on to see what we can do. Uh, if we can get uh, through the um, uh, get a permit for that, and we can generate some recharge credits for that, like fifty percent or something. Like yeah, the way I think the ADWR rules work is that if you have a managed facility, you can get ninety five percent credit. This would be an unmanaged facility, so it would be 50% credit. We have to look at, though, when we send that over, then there's actually uh, requirements for monitoring and some other stuff. So we have to look at overall what that permit is going to require. Because right now it's just overflowing and, and running down a, a, a ancillary creek into Cape Creek Wash. So we'd have to look at, you know, do we have the legal right to be in that area and everything. So, But it is something that we want to look at overall. Right. Yeah. Thank as, you. As, as you can see in this next table, uh, you know, the amount of... Uh, um, and this is about an 18 month period of time. So we went from January of last year. Uh, it, it shows the, the first column is the um, wastewater treatment effluent in acre feet per month. Then we have the uh, uh, water treatment, uh, the reclaimed water and cap divert water is actually what we call the water we divert from the pollen membrane system. And then the, the next is the raw cap water deliveries. You can see again, it's in the summertime that they ask for raw water deliveries. Uh, so we have the total amount delivered to the ponds uh, and then the total build. So the uh, third and fourth to last columns, there's a third uh, called pond overflows and pond evaporation. So the pond overflow, we do actually have a meter on the overflow. And you can see last year, 73 acre feet of water overflowed the pond system. That happens in the wintertime. But then corresponding in the, the summertime, you have the pond evaporation. So where we got this number from is actually we work with Maricopa County uh, Maricopa County keeps an evaporative pan system up at Lake Pleasant. So we actually pull down that data set. Uh, so they actually have an evaporation meter that's constantly filling and refilling. You have to pull the data set out and normalize it. Uh, so it's actually almost double the evaporation that you'd normally use as a rule of thumb, but we thought that using the Lake Pleasant evaporative meter gives us a, a good measure of what actually is being lost by that lake system up there. So. <laughs> Water temp is going to make a huge difference on that, isn't it? It's not in the, the lake. It's next to the lake. Oh, next to the lake. Okay. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, okay. Never mind. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I actually want to go up and see it, but they've actually got it online. They actually download the data set so you can you can pull it off. So um, Hal Marin actually uh, uh, pointed out to us, and we were able to get to their website and pull off the raw data set from them. So what it really shows to us is, is again, in the wintertime, we're producing more water than they can consume, and we overflow the lake. And in the summertime, there's a lot of evaporation. So... We do want to uh, bring them to the table, talk to them about how the contracts are structured right now and see if there's anything we can do. The pond evaporation, there are things you can do. I know they use the ponds as, as a um, aesthetic feature at the, the golf course, uh, but you know this is, this is a lot of water being evaporated off a lake that we're delivering we're not getting any credit for. So it's not a, not a good situation for the town. I have a, a question for you. Uh, using the numbers here, uh, on a previous uh, set of numbers, there was approximately 1,290 acre feet of water that were utilized within the Cave Creek water system. Mm -hmm. If you subtract the 378 that are going to go to Carefree, 
and which are probably already going to care for you one way or another. It brings you down to 912. There are 293 acre feet uh, between the uh, reclaim and diversion water and the raw cap water. That means that 32 percent of the water for Cave Creek is going to Rancho Manana. Is that correct? As an overall water calculation, including treated effluent, yes. 32 percent. Yeah, if you look at okay. our overall water balance. And a substantial amount of that is non-revenue, right? Correct. That's what I know. Since I've been here, this it's been a, a, a topic that's where the recording in progress. <laughs> uh, that's why the the pond overflow meter was uh, put in place just after uh, before I started. It was put in place. We had some issues the first year with it, so we have staff monitoring that. So we want to know the total of going to that system. It's not the most efficient system, is really what we're coming down to, and the fact that the way it's structured contractually that they only bill for what they draw off of the lakes, not what we deliver to the rate lakes is the, the structural problem. Now, I got a question about the meters. Mm -hmm. Our meter shows we deliver a heck of a lot of water. Mm -hmm. Their meter shows we don't deliver a heck of a lot of water, substantially less. Why? That, I know that, you've answered this before, but yeah. It, yeah, that, that's just inherent in the system. If, if uh, I wish I had a graphic up, but it's actually a three lake system. So uh, we have two pipelines that run up to the, to the golf course. The one is the effluent line that runs all the way from the water ranch and, and, and gets pumped up. There's two effluent pumps at the water ranch that, that deliver that flow up to, the, up to the golf course. And there's also a, a, an eight inch line that runs from the, the uh, water treatment plant up and over to the lake. So there's two points of delivery into the, the upper lake system. So, uh, and the, the upper two lakes actually cascade into each other. The upper we fill cascades in the lower, they're fairly shallow lakes. And then the larger uh, holding lake is, is the third lake and that's where they draw their water from. So the way the contract is structured is that we deliver water to them and then they only get charged for the water they draw off the bottom end of it. So again, since we know the pond overflow, so in the wintertime, we fill the lake up to capacity and there actually is an overflow like last year, calendar year, 2020, 73 acre feet of water actually overflowed that lake system that they could not use largely because of wintertime when their flows, their irrigation demands are so low. That's when we have the highest uh, effluent flow out of our water treatment plant. So, so we've got enough waste water either effluent or uh yeah or cap process water, water from the the, the cap. so that we we push it over there but they don't utilize it uh yes yeah it's either being lost by pond overflow or pond evaporation and or some liner losses would be the third component so the lake system itself is, has has some structural issues with the leaking in the past, there was thought that more of the flow was going to liner losses, but when we were able to get this data set from Maricopa County on evaporation, that sort of skewed the numbers more towards the, the lakes themselves. The evaporation is a lot more than we would have expected. Okay, so now, from what yeah, you know, what I've said, I think the most impressive uh, number is thirty-two percent of our uh, water goes to Rancho Manana. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Test. So. It's obviously something that we're, we want to talk to them about. Uh, we've gone to uh, um, billing with them. Uh, we used to do annual bills. Now we're tr we did bill. We're trying to get to monthly billing with them to help balance the revenue stream out. But we do need to talk to them about the overall efficiency of that delivery system and that that water system with them. Um, next chart is our water loss chart, and I will point out right now that our June data set is missing some data set. So uh, we didn't get the flushing data in, in time to, to uh, um, get this updated. But you can see in February, we had some compliance flushing. Uh, we also had some large line breaks that occurred. Um, again, this is one of these things that we monitor. This is a part of our non-revenue loss water in the system uh, from uh, ADR, ADWR perspective. When they look at our water accounting, uh, we don't really get credit for this, but if we know where it's going, that allows us to better manage it. Uh, so again, the June data set is missing, um, but we are trying to do this. But one of the inherent things in our water system is that we have to, to do a fair amount of flushing in our distribution lines because we don't have a lot of consumption in some areas and to, to keep the water uh, fresh. Um, and that's just a problem that we have. And the, uh, I introduced these, I think, a couple meetings ago. The next two are, are non-revenue calculations. We're trying to look at uh, the first one's uh, Cave Creek and Carefree totals. We're looking at the total uh, deliveries uh, versus what we build through our Cassell system. 
We are seeing a few differences when, when things are actually being monitored and measured that we're trying to uh, clean up. But you can see right now our, our non-billed water um, uh, in Cave Creek is, is increasing now. We're getting into the summertime. So we're going we're to see what we can do to try and bring that closer together. We do. I was just talking with staff today. We think it might have been a, a little bit of a timing factor, but not as much. In Desert Hills, we have a timing factor when the, the wells uh, were red. Uh, we have three production wells and when they were red versus when we did the billing data set can have a little bit of a difference it's surprising we actually did an analysis looking at a week shift in data sets and that actually had a fairly significant amount in percentage wise so we're trying to make sure that every reads the same day sean i, I want to yeah. compliment you on this kind of data yeah. this uh monitoring how much we how much goes through the cash register versus how much goes on the ground um, this is the kind of stuff we really need. I know you put this in place and you deserve credit for that. Thank you. You're welcome. Again, it's good operation of the system. We need to know where the water's going and where we're getting our generating revenue. So the next one is, uh, it's, it's labeled non-revenue water and we will change the title. It's, it's our Desert Hill system. Um, so in the, the steep increase or in May, we think the issue was the, the reading of the, um, the meters versus when the, uh, the, uh, um, uh, our product, our, our, or, or account meters were red. There was a time shift of a couple of days and that actually had a significant difference out there when the, the increase was occurring. But our goal is to keep this going and make sure everything's in sync. Uh, one of the things I will point out is one project that we got to uh, uh, resurrect um, is actually going back to the CAP meter. So the um, before I started, there was an issue with the, the overall meter in the cap pipeline at our cap delivery booster station. Uh, a temporary meter was inserted back in 2017. It's been in place and that was supposed to be replaced as part of the, the um, upgrade to the CAP booster station. So um, that meter uh, really needs to be updated to something more uh, like a, a magnetic uh, flow meter. Right now it's just an insertion meter. Um, so we believe that's adding to some of our accuracy. <laughs> so it goes back to overall accounting, you know, how much water are we pushing up the pipeline? Uh, there's a question and CAP has asked us to, to install a more accurate meter. And that, that's our base calculation is, you know, what's coming up the pipeline versus, you know, we have all the meters at the top end where it goes in the plant and they don't calculate on a daily average. And some days we're actually making water if you actually add all the meters together. So we need to get that reconciled. Switching over into our uh, uh, wastewater system, our collection system is uh, obviously we have the grease traps. Uh, I'd say an advantage, but with everything going on with COVID, again, there's been a drop in the usage. Um, so it looks like everybody has been in compliance and keeping up with their uh, wastewater um, grease trap systems, your interceptor systems. John, a question. I, I, I have noticed anecdotally that we do not seem to have had a odor problem down at the water ranch since we began vigorously enforcing grease regulations. Is, is that your impression, Tim? You know, in the two years I've been here, we have done a few things. Um, I think the grease trap uh, interceptor program pretreatment system has helped. We've also tried, we've had, uh, you know, we uh, cleaned the main line for the first time in a number of years down there. And we were being very aggressive with the bioxide treatment that we use at the Rancho Mignana uh, lift station site that helps keep down odors overall. But we've not had any complaints down there in some time, have we? No, no. We've been working directly with the neighbors. Um, you know, we've, we've brought them on board. We've talked to them. We've showed them what's going on. We've actually taken their input and, and the staff have really been trying to work with them. You know, sewer odors are, are they're just obnoxious. So, you know, we try to be as, as uh, proactive as we can. And sometimes it's as simple as cleaning a line out. Um, you could have a, a, a belly in line that's holding some material up. So that's us being proactive on the collection system and managing that. And there are some cases where we are do, doing chemical uh, odor uh, treatment. So we're trying to optimize that because it's not cheap, but it's also effective. But so we have to balance that out. Um, wanted to give uh, council some updates on just uh, our water availability. Um, so one thing that we've been trying to work on, uh, and you know, I'll give credit to my staff, is we've been trying to pull together all the certificates of assured water supply since I've been here. I've looked back and I can, I found uh, the earliest document I can found is dated 2002, as far as Cave Creek Water Company was private water company, as far as ADWR was, was doing a spreadsheet, trying to do a certificate, uh, listing all the certificates and trying to account for them all. But there's always been some overlaps. And so it's been some asterisks in the, the tables, which talked about that there potentially could be some duplicates. And that, you know, really it's on us as the water provider to clean that up and work with ADWR staff to clean that up. 
So we thought uh, in February, we took the effort to go through all the certificates that we had. We downloaded as much as we can, looked through our files, pulled it all together. And of the 103 certificates that we could see listed, uh, we were missing 22. So we made that public records request uh, back in February. It was just actually received from them in July. So, um, you know, a government agency, they're short staffed. Uh, they have given us, there's actually four certificates they couldn't find all the records on. So we're just seeing how we pull that together. But the next slide I'll show is we've actually been trying to map these to try and see where the overlaps are so we can pull this all together. So I know that's one question I, I often get is where are we at with the water allocation? Because uh, certificates of assured water supply have been issued against the CAP allocation. And, and where do we stand in that? Some of the certificates actually also um, talk about co-mingled water, uh, groundwater, as well as CAP water. So we're trying to map that out also, which ones included groundwater. Where right now we currently are not using the town's groundwater allocation, our production wells not in surface, but that's something we want to look at moving forward. You know, is there some benefit to us trying to bring the wells back online? And that's part of the overall water portfolio for the for the town and water resources system. Can I ask a quick question? Yes. Sean, um, could you tell me how much water we have in our storage tanks? At this time, I have to go back and look at it. Uh, you know, in the main system, we have the two reservoirs we keep active, the Neary Reservoir and then the Rock uh, uh, Rockaway uh, Reservoir. Um, Neary, we try to keep fairly full just because of the amount of water goes in and out. It's only a million gallon reservoir. I don't have that number in front of me, but typically we're running Rockaway about half full. Uh, if it fluctuates because of water quality issues in that area, uh, Rockaway is about two million gallons, two point two theoretically. So we're running about a million gallons of storage up in Rockaway, and then uh, about less than just under half, uh, less than a million gallons in 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 uh, at the Neary Reservoir. Okay, thank so. you. Yeah, you know, it's something we have to balance uh, in the water system because you can't just keep the reservoirs completely full. You can mix them up, but you still need to get that water out of it. And it's, mm -hmm. it's hard. And the, the positioning of the Rockaway site is a bit of a challenge for staff just because I, I understand why it was placed up there for system overall system reliability. I thought that it can help backfeed the main system in a gravity situation. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, pending a, a, a large water demand, that water sits up there unless we try to force it in and out of that reservoir. And, mm -hmm. and water age is, is, is the, the bane of water systems. Mm -hmm. so. Mm -hmm. um, so the answer to the other question is will serve letters. So we, are, we have a data set as pro approximately uh, 420 will serve letters that we, we track. Um, 226 in Cave Creek, 166 in Desert Hills, 32 in Carefree. Um, and uh, we approximately get about 14 a month. So not all of those are approved. Some of them are, we're have to say no to, we've actually had a couple come through where someone's done what we consider a, a subdivision, a, a lot split totaling more than four lots in the county. I think their, their threshold's one lot higher. So we've had a couple of people who've had to say no to because you've done the lot splits and sub subdivision per the water policy. In other cases, it's just, they need to do line extension. So but we wanted to give you just some numbers. I'll try and get you a better table next, next month. And I've got a question, Mr. Sims, you might want to pay attention to this one too. If you look at this <laughs> slide, we're just talking about the uh, water availability. Uh, there's uh, 32 will serve letters in carefree. Mm -hmm. Sean is working on the operational policy. Those will have to be transferred to Carefree pursuant to the... To the yeah, because they come out of that award portion of, of their... Okay, just want to make sure we're... I, I figured we were on top of it, but it's kind of important. And, and that's actually also a... That, that's also will serves, but there's also certificates. Actually, actually something I want to talk to because Carefree has started the process of, of the transfer of the water allocation. Um, but I do want to make sure that ADWR accounts for the certificates that are in Carefree that they're taking right. with them so that those get transferred over and they're not added in our pot. Right. So that's one of the reasons for us making sure that we've got them all accounted for and say, those are all yeah. them. Not another draw on our, <laughs> not another draw on our allocation above me on. Yeah. So again, Carefree is taking the lead on doing the allocation transfer. I want to follow that up by saying, here's all the certificates you need to take with it. <laughs> so uh, quickly, I think I've, uh, shown it once before, but again, we're trying to, to answer this question, is there overlaps? Because uh, if you're not familiar with their certificate process, it can get com complicated because you can uh, give a certificate for a parcel of land. Uh, you can say that you assume you're going to get a certain density out of it. Uh, example, you might get 100, you, you're thinking you're going to lead a, a 150 lot or yield 150 lots out of that. So you, you do your certificate, initial certificate. 
then you realize that you can't get that. And then you, you downgrade that certificate. And then you make makes changes within the area, the, the development area where it's not covering the entire area. That's the issue we're having is it's stacking them all together. So we're using our GIS system to map them out, find where there's their um, issues and make sure that whenever there's a, a stacking situation that they're properly accounted for. And we'll go back to ADWR with this information and, and clarify again, we can clarify which ones are in, in carefree and which ones are, are in our water system. And, and again, if there's any duplicates, can we get those eliminated and have them agree that there are duplicates? Uh, next slide is uh, just doing an update on our capital program and some, some operational issues we've got going on there. Uh, so I figured I'd talk about a couple of big ones. Um, we have the interconnect with the city of Phoenix. So we are working uh, with Black and Beach on that design. We're working on the conceptual design. Preliminary design is what we, uh, council will ask us, uh, allowed me to award at this point. So we're up to a, what we call a 30% design. So this will be wrapping up in the next couple of months and we'll be coming back now that once we set the parameters for the site layout and some other improvements uh, and coming back with what it's gonna, it's gonna take to complete the design. Um, and as part of that, we're actually looking at overall distribution system because it's, it's um, bringing this water into uh, the system. We're talking about a new million gallon storage reservoir at this site, and then how that will feed and interact with our NERI system and the booster station up there is, is critical because effectively we'll have two ways of delivering water and or distributing because this site can actually feed into the NERI system is what the intent is. So if we have to take the cap pipeline and the water treatment plant down for either emergency or say a planned outage, so we can do some, uh, some longer term significant improvements, we wanna make sure we can feed the rest of the system. So um, uh, as part of that, we're looking at things like uh, where fire booster pumps, NERI, the NERI site was built so it can actually provide the fire flow for main system. So do we need to replicate that down at the, the city of Phoenix interconnect if the two sites are gonna work in conjunction, that's a cost savings we can do. So we don't have to put those larger fire pumps at the city of Phoenix interconnect. And that could, the, the city of Phoenix interconnect site can more meet the, uh, the uh, pressure zone needs for what we call pressure zone one and pressure zone four. So those are the types of discussions. So as we wrap this phase up, and as I come to uh, council to award the, the rest of the design, I'll probably uh, I'll give you a summary on the preliminary design of that site. So we'll get your the ETA for having that interconnect in service? Uh, we're still trying to get it done by the end of 2023. So two more years. So we're in design phase now. I'll probably start the next phase will be a solicitation I'll do is for a construction manager at risk because I do believe uh, doing a alternate delivery where we pre-select a contractor to help be part of the team could help uh, yield some, some cost savings, some efficiency in the design. Once we set the preliminary design parameters, they can help us figure out what equipment and some other stuff that we want to do or some other ways we can, uh, can, can deal with that. Um, but yeah, we're trying to sync with the uh, city of Phoenix uh, contractual obligation. So that leads into the city of Phoenix disconnect. So we have um, you know, two disconnects going on in the system right now. We're working with Carefree uh, on their work to disconnect. And then we have city of Phoenix uh, working to disconnect the areas south of, uh, of uh, Carefree Highway in the system. Uh, we just got update that by August, they'll give us a 90% design. Uh, they are still at this point looking out to delay the project for actual construction for another year. So they'll wrap up design, get it all permitted, all ready to go. And they've selected contractors to do the work, but just because of funding constraints in their CIP, they've told us they're, they're going to put a, a gap into their project. So it'll be done by the time that the IGA uh, says it needs to be done, which is the end of 2023. And that's our goal is to have the city, uh, our, our interconnect site up and operational at the same time frame. So. Uh, in the long run, will Phoenix be providing water to all of Cape Creek south of Carefree Highway? Yes. Do we know how much water that will put back into the Cape Creek system that will no longer be utilized by those uh, businesses and residents? Uh, you know, I, I, I thought that same question myself the other week, and I didn't pull the report. There's actually only a handful of meters that are our meters right now south of there. Most of the meters, um, everything uh, west of Cave Creek Road is actually a city Phoenix uh, distribution meter. We're only providing fire services or the sprouts to hospital um, uh -huh. uh, tractor supply. So it's really just the meters to um, Burger King, uh, the, the small mall in front of Walmart that has the uh, firehouse subs and Walmart itself. Those are the only meters that we currently have down there that are on our water system. So we're not going to get thousands of acres. No. <laughs> <laughs> I initially thought, and when I started that calculation, I think it's only four, <laughs> I think it's only four meters that we're giving up. <laughs> Thank you. So, 
Um, another project we have ongoing is the uh, sewer collection system evaluation. So we did a, a phase one last year. Uh, uh, we're wrapping into the phase two where we've done some preliminary work. Uh, this uh, project helped us uh, work and investigate and remap the collection system. So we found, I think it's a total of 15 manholes now that we had to uh, unbury and bring back up to grades. We can get into the lines. And as part of this, they're going to be updating the wastewater model and then wrapping up the um, evaluation, which will give us the recommendations moving forward. So it's almost our mini CIP on the collection system. This will be wrapped into our integrated master planning effort and will be uh, uh, pretty far ahead because we'll know a lot more about the collection system and we'll actually have a good uh, sewer model that we can then run uh, scenarios on. So, but it's been a good process overall. We found a few areas of concern and we've been addressing them and just finding the manholes has been a challenge and I uh, give kudos to my staff for working on that. Um, next one I, want, did, I sort of alluded to, but I talked about is the uh, city care free uh, system disconnect. Um, so we do have the um, uh, agreement in place with carefree. Uh, right now, at this point, we're attending weekly meetings with their project team, just going over issues. Uh, um, so they are working on their design for all three neighborhoods. Uh, neighborhood A is the area by Carefree Highway. Neighborhood B is the area south of Cave Creek Road and sort of the, uh, um, uh, I'm trying to think, Bella Vista area. And neighborhood C is the area by, I, I refer to as Scopa, north of, of Cave Creek Road through the town core. Um, so they're focused on, on neighborhood C to start with, with doing the conversion. So uh, in the last couple of weeks, they've been working on design. They've been actually physically going out and potholing to make sure that they have, it's not just on our disconnects, but actually all the reconnects that they need to do. So they've assembled a project team. They have a construction manager at risk uh, that's been selected. They've got their designer and they've actually selected, I think, a firm that's going to do construction administration for them overall. Um, so I think I, I could say it's, it, I feel like it's, it's been good that they've included us. Um, the uh, settlement payment was transferred last month. La it went through last week. There's a million dollar payment. That was per the settlement agreement. So they made it in. Um, so we have that in place. And now they're talking about um, they've started the process to transfer the CAP water allocation. Uh, we expect that to take six to nine months. So that just started, I think, over a month ago. So by the end of the year, we think that'll be in place or beginning of the spring. And all that from a logistical standpoint, that'll just be a matter of uh, who places the order. So the orders are due with the CAP in um, September, end of September. So I'm assuming the transfer is not done. So I'll be placing the order for those accounts. And then as the transfer is over, we'll just have to work with the CAP staff to make sure that we're accounting for who's, whose allocations are coming from at that point. So another headache. And, and Carefree does want to start working on some, some, you know, instead of taking over the large areas, they've talked to us about taking over some smaller bites of some areas, including one area that they want to try with us. It's changing out some meters. It's a small neighborhood. It has about 15, I think it's 15 meters. They want to put their meters in it while we're still serving water and see how we can transfer the account data between the two systems. Because logistically, they're not, you just can't turn the, the pipes on and off and change out all the meters. So we're trying to work with them to, to uh, impact the systems as, as minimal as possible. So that's the next step. So we're working through design. We're probably going to try this uh, one test area with the metering and see how that's going to work. And then I can come back and I'll, I'll keep council informed on what we're doing with them. Uh, project that we're doing down at our water ranch. Um, again, this is kind of a, a unique one I wanted to bring up to your attention. There's been a lot of work down there. I'll give kudos to the, uh, the staff down there and our maintenance staff have been working just to and the facility is 10 years old. It's a, a wastewater facility, so it, it, sears, it sees a severe environment. It runs 24-7. So uh, you are actually seeing pictures of a diver that we had to bring in. So uh, we draw, uh, the divers can actually go into the basins live. The, the picture on the, uh, the right-hand side is, is one of our, um, our uh, sequence batch reactors, our SBR basins, uh, without any uh, liquid in it. And you can see what at the bottom of the picture, you'll see what they call aeration heads. So we actually have an air compressor system that pushes air down into those and it actually sends bubbles up through those heads. It has two purposes. The one is it provides oxygen for the uh, microbiology to help uh, break down the wastewater stream and it actually also mixes the system. So one of the two basins we're having some trouble with and we were afraid also of how much debris had potentially collected in this because we actually are having some issues in the headworks at the plant. So. The driver, uh, twofold, he went into all the basins, looked around to uh, uh, verify if there's debris in them, and then uh, verified that the air system was broken. And we did find we were having, uh, the operators were struggling with uh, uh, our SBR basin number two, and we found that one of the down legs was actually broken. 
So instead of getting all the air to those diffusers, we were sending a lot of air out of one corner of the, of the basin. So we brought the divers back and they did a temporary repair. And now we're talking about a permanent repair that we might want to do, but um, yeah, they did find a lot of material, but not in the two um, uh, uh, process basins. We found it in, in the, um, uh, 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 the sludge basin had a significant amount of debris that we'll have to work with them on a project to actually clean that out. And it's kind of neat because the divers can do it while the system's live. So they'll go through and, and pull off the debris and decant it and send it back through the clean liquid. So uh, we plan to hopefully do that in the next few months and try to get that um, um, uh, uh, sludge basin cleaned out. Uh, it's one of those more unique things you don't usually see. And yeah, again, this, uh, and he's the owner of the company who went down. So yeah. <laughs> I got 200, 200 hours underwater, but it's salt water. It's not <laughs> Fine, <Jimmy. laughs> they did a good job. I'll give them that. And, he, and ironically, you can't see anything when he's down there. He's doing everything by touch and feel. So, yeah. I'm yeah. not surprised. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, our collection system is something, obviously we're doing the assessment, uh, next slide, Brian. And, uh, one thing that we've talked to council a lot about, uh, since I've been hearing you before is our Rancho Mignano lift station. So I want to show some improvements that we've uh, been making. Uh, what you're seeing is the slab area that got poured, uh, which is south of the site. So with our public work staff last, uh, um, I think it was during the fall, we actually removed the basin or the bay, the berm that was there and gave us better access to the site. Uh, it, we actually did some piping modifications at the site so that it proved useful having this area because we actually do some of our pumping and then the staff can actually go up, uh, we can do our crane truck up here and actually lift the pumps out more easily from this. this. So we're going to continue doing some improvements. Didn't cost as much to put that in and actually also gave us a place to put an odor scrubber. So we actually now have what was a passive little carbon odor scrubber. We actually have now what we refer to as an active. So you can see in the bottom slide, there's actually a fan drawing air off the wet well. And it goes through that canister. Um, it's actually two two folds at the bottom. It's actually uh, cedar chips, which actually absorb the water, and then above it is is uh, activated charcoal, um, and that actually consumes the, uh, the the odors. So I think it's made a marked improvement out there. So I know that has been an issue. And when we had the bypass pumping going on uh, past April, you could smell it out at the golf course. Uh, I'll be honest, you, it, it didn't smell good. So that's partly because the lid was open and we didn't have an odor scrubber system. So our goal is to try and improve that site and continue to enhance it. We are working with the pump supplier because we've been continuing to investigate uh, the fact that the flows aren't as high. And we actually found the original um, submittals and specifications for the pumps out there and they're not working as designed. We believe it's partly because the uh, what's referred to as the dynamic head on the pipeline system on the eight inch force main is, is higher than was anticipated. So those pumps are working what we refer to as author curve. So uh, we're talking to the vendor about some other improvements. Uh, we also think that while we've done some piping improvements to the site, uh, one thing we just observed in the last couple of weeks is that where the, the pumps actually sit in the bottom of the wet well, we haven't observed this before, but we're starting to see some leaking. So we're losing pumping efficiency. So we're actually going in uh, next week uh, to do some further investigation, but we might have to re replace that, that bottom elbow. When we were in there just last year, it was not found to be a problem. We think there's some additional wear that's happening. So the pump is not fitting properly. So we're losing some pressure at the, the pump base. So uh, that's the next two steps that we're gonna try to improve. And sorry, I'm going long here. Our distribution staff, next slide, Brian. Uh, I've been very busy. Uh, uh, you know, you see some credit here. So, you know, one thing that we've been doing here is instead of just, you know, doing a quick wrap on something, we try to replace. So we do been doing a lot of service line repairs. The staff often find that they, they, they find multiple repair bands have been placed on a service line. So it's better just to replace it in kind. And we hopefully don't see that thing again for the next four years is really our goal. Um, and again, they also had some large breaks that they've had to deal with. So I'll give kudos to, again, my distribution staff or just uh, like everybody are all working and trying to do a lot of improvements in the system and just keeping stuff. And we're spending a lot of time just still uh, mapping the system and just uh, finding valves similar to, you know, even more so than the collection system with buried manholes. Uh, the, the, the valves are a lot easier to, to get lost under uh, someone filling in their, their front yard. So that's, that's still a tr struggle for us. Next slide, Brian. In the last three months have been busy just in our overall maintenance crew. Our, our crew actually does a lot for us. Uh, the bottom uh, 
bright slide is showing our Desert Hills, our 7th Street Booster Station. So there was a lot of work done and actually it was done with Public Works. Uh, the trees were completely overgrown around that site. So Public Works came in. We actually tried to reach out to some vendors uh, um, to give us some quotes. And a couple of them just basically refused. <laughs> they said they're just too busy. So it was a, a good day's work for our public work crew. And they just, they cleaned that site up immensely. I'm surprised. And then we followed that up by going in and actually looking at the site itself. We've had a few issues. This site provides basically in Desert Hills, all the flow uh, for North of Joy Ranch Road um, in the system. Uh, so we had a couple of issues out there. And, and part of that was going back to, you know, we looked at the initial mapping and there was three different conflicting drawings and how the site was configured. So we, we spent a couple of days exposing piping to make sure that we knew how it all worked. And we found some new stuff about how the site works so that it makes it more efficient for us. So this is a good effort the staff went through. And again, we worked with our public work staff to do that. Um, the next picture over on the bottom, you'll see that's one of the pumps out of our Neary booster station. We couldn't find any records of those pumps being pulled since they were uh, put in operation in late 2009, I believe. So we had one of them pulled out and uh, we basically had to rebuild all the impellers. It's a five stage impeller system. So now we know what we're getting into. There's still two more left. So our goal is to pull those out and get them serviced. Um, uh, you can see uh, we also have been working on the pressure reducing valves. The way our system works is, is at our nearest site, uh, we these large pumps boost the pressure up to the, the pressure that actually feeds the town core system. And then we have a, a large, it's a 10 inch diameter pressure reducing valve that then cuts some of that pressure down so it can move down, down the hill, directly down Cave Creek Road. And then it goes through a couple other PRVs and we distribute it. So um, yeah, the staff have actually rebuilt those, all the PRVs on that site. And we've been working our way through the system. There's just a, I, I think they're all been touched now. The Neary one was one of our last ones. And I think we put it on notice. We did put it on notice on it, but I think, because uh, the potential uh, outage area that if this wasn't coming back in service was very large, <laughs> all the way out to 24th Street, affecting the system from, from the town core. So uh, give kudos to the staff. They did it uh, quickly and efficiently, and we actually kept everybody in water. We did reduce pressure, but we kept everybody in water. So the last one, uh, Council might remember a few months ago, we had a, a, um, the resident next to our um, Carroll Heights booster station. Uh, was concerned. We had some issues with, uh, we were trying to clean up with the fires last year. We went around to a lot of our sites and we're trying to clear debris away from the fence lines. We thought that we actually had our, our the, the, we had some area outside this fence. We actually went and had a, a contractor come in and clear the area. And then we found out that actually we had third trespassed. So, <laughs> um, but as part of that, we actually also gave us room to put up a new, uh, what was put in uh, when the site was reconstructed uh, back in 2008, 2009 was actually just a six foot high chain link fence. So the neighbor is immediately adjacent to it. So now we've got a solid eight foot fence. Eight foot is more typical standard for a water facility and it, it's a solid metal fence. Uh, so it'll, it'll start to rust here, it'll, it'll rustify out a little bit, um, uh, but it'll be, it's an, I think a significant improvement and it has cut down the noise just to the neighbors next to them. So our goal is to be a good neighbor to our, our uh, adjacent landowners. And this one secured the site a little bit better. So, and that's, I know I've been talking here for a while and I apologize, we've got a lot going on in, 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 in the system overall. And again, I can't thank my staff enough for all the work that they do. And we're trying to get more better information for council. So it does take time, but uh, we're committed to doing that because it helps us run the system more efficiently. So, just one more. Yeah, I have Any a couple questions. of questions. Is there any way that we can bring the demand and the supply of our wastewater for, with regard to supplying Rancho Manana in line? I mean, I don't think we can do pump storage <laughs> with uh, wastewater, but obviously we have an issue with producing more water in the winter, they need it in the summer. Yeah. Is there some way to equalize that? Well, it's actually, uh, I just was reading through the, the master plans recently because I'm trying to work as part of the rate model looking at our capital program going out a little bit longer with the capital program, but um, it's been identified in the 2008 and even prior to that. And then the 2013 master plans were talked about uh, really trying to do some uh, recharging with that water. Uh, it's just a common problem with uh, um, in, in the, in Arizona, specifically Maricopa County, when you do a reclaimed water system, the demand for irrigation, because that's typically what you use your irrigation, your, uh, your, your purple pipe system for, goes down in the wintertime when your wastewater flows your highest. 
So uh, what most jurisdictions do, most uh, water operators do is they actually do a balance system where you have a, some sort of recharge system so you can put that back into the ground and get credits for it. So when it's not being consumed, um, you, can, you, can, you basically have a dual system. You're either sending it to customers or you're putting it in the ground and getting ground credits. So the, we're missing that second leg. We're not putting it into the ground. That, that ground then would be a bank, essentially a banking. Correct. And then the aquifer, underground aquifer. Yeah, as it was early, mentioned earlier, you know, uh, we do the overflow of the lake. Is there a way for us to uh, get that permitted as a, as a what they call an unmanaged facility so we can get credits for it? Or do we want to come up with a managed facility or do something else? That's something we do need to sit down and look at. And I hope to with the next master plan to map that out. There are some permitting issues involved. Initially, when the, the, the water ranch was constructed at Carefree Highway, there was actually the original concepts had, had recharge facilities at that site. If council's not aware, there is the old landfill site directly south of that. There actually is water quality issues with that landfill. So um, it was uh, uh, at the point there was not going to be a permit issued because the, the potential for us recharging just north of Carefree Highway could flush that water out when they're actually trying to treat and remove the contaminants from the system over there. And my other question is with the Rockaway Hills tank, do I understand that we are not filling that up because if we have interruption in our water supply coming up from the CAP canal, mm -hmm. uh, then we need to draw from our storage. And mm -hmm. is that, are we uh, having less storage in the Rockaway Hills tank than, uh, the, than the capacity of the tank? Well, again, that's going back to how we have to manage the system for, uh, you know, uh, Wet water in the pipes is important, but also uh, uh, water that meets all permit requirements is also important for us too. So that goes back to the other processes that we're spending a lot more time on general maintenance and things like the cap pipeline. So we're spending a lot more time on inspecting and maintaining the booster pump stations, make sure they're operational. Um, uh, and then also the treatment plant itself is a lot more reliable than I think it ever has been between the Paul trailers and the work that's been done on the existing Trident unit. So, the, the likelihood that we'd have a significant outage, especially at the water treatment plant, because we do have between the, the, the four tr existing Trident membranes uh, systems and then the Paul systems, we have a lot of treatment capacity there. We're only permitted for 3 million gallons uh, a day average, but we have a lot more treatment than that between the two. So we have a lot of flexibility there, something more to go down. The cap pipeline is still a uh, uh, concern, but we're working with Phoenix on making sure that anytime anybody works around it, we're informed and better informed about it. And again, with all the work the staff have been doing to improve the reliability of the booster pump stations, we feel a lot more comfortable the fact that we can put the water into the system as, as demand requires it, rather than having sitting in storage and then having uh, water age issues and other water quality issues to deal with. So we have to, that is a balance that we have to deal with. And this, the, the reservoirs are designed to flex. They'll never be fully full. So the, you, you fill a reservoir and you expect it to drop because it, you use that to buffer your, your system demands rather than having all that instantaneous treatment capacity. There are two different demand cycles. So, balancing back. Thank you. Yeah. Mayor. I, want, I wonder at this point in time, if I can ask if, if we could go ahead and postpone the questions until the end of the meeting out of, out of uh, respect for the three experts that are sitting waiting for us to continue this uh, you can do that as the mayor yeah. i can do that all right let's let's go ahead and do it. sorry sean you get to hang around <clears throat> uh, we're on back to agenda item number one which is uh council approval engagement letter with webbush securities incorporated to serve as municipal advisor to the town of cape freak on a whiff alone to be refunded hi pat sorry about that that's okay um can you hear me now absolutely Oh, great. Okay. Mayor, members of the council, what you have before you is the same thing you had a few months ago, where it is the engagement letter to hire um, Jim Strickland from Wedbush Securities as your municipal finance advisor. He represented the town very well in the last deal where we got a refunding and, and uh, did a lot of work to get that deal done and saved the town a lot of money. And, um, and if you had a chance to review what he's handed out, I think you're going to see the same thing. So this, this particular action is just to approve the engagement letter with him, and then we'll get into the refunding. Jim Strickland is on the line, as well as Tim Stratton, who is our bond counsel. Do you have any questions for council? Councilman Silva. Thank you, Mayor. 
I have a question regarding the contract. It's a lump sum contract. Are these ever done on a uh, cost basis, bill per hour, with perhaps a floor and a ceiling or not to exceed number? Or did the RFP from the town go out uh, as uh, a lump sum? Uh, Mayor, members of the council, it wasn't an RFP, and this is the normal billing that is done by financial advisors um, based on the amount of bonds. And even though the bonds have increased, I, I think the, the pricing is still the same. Jim, did you want to speak to it? Um, Mayor, members of the council, um, uh, I understand the question is, is this ever done on an hourly basis? And uh, the general answer is no. This, um, it's on a project by project uh, basis uh, in the event that we don't hit our targets or the savings isn't there and there's no um, actual transaction consummated, we don't get paid anything. Um, and so it's, a, it's only based on whether or not we achieve the expected uh, results within the parameters of the authorizing resolution, okay. which I, I believe is similar to the way bond council and other professionals involved with uh, public finance matters are, are handled. I think you answered the second question I had, and that is if for some reason uh, the rates go crazy in the next few days and you're not able to get a rate of less than 2%, then I'm going to assume the fee is not earned and not payable. Is that correct? That's correct. And, and then my uh, one more question, and that is, I I looked through everything, and it's uh, it led me to believe that we were that the eight hundred thousand dollars approximately we were saving uh, was through a reduction in the interest rate. Uh, my question is, I didn't have the information. Uh, if we're going to get something of uh, what you're proposing, less than two percent. Uh, what's the current rate we're paying? Is it like between three and four or three or three and a half? 3.49%. 3.49? Okay, so that that's, makes up the bulk or all of the anticipated $800,000 savings. Correct. Okay, thank you. Vice Mayor, you had some? No? Anyone else? All right, um, there's public comment on this one. Mr. Uh, Mr. Phelps is hanging around somewhere. I think I'm unmuted. Yeah, there you are, Mr. Yeah. Phelps. Mr. Phelps. Hey, welcome back. Yep. Uh, Ernie, I very much appreciate you making a point that you knew that all these experts were out there waiting to speak. I really appreciate that. Um, Mr. Strickland. I would like to ask you a question about what you would presume to be the hourly investment your firm's gonna to have to make to do this transaction. Number of hours, 100, 1,000, 10? We don't track hours. Wow. Actually, it's not appropriate for, for you to be actually uh, questioning the, go ahead, Mr. Sims. I know you're gonna say the same thing. This is a Public comment. The public is allowed to make comments. Public to you. comment. Is not but allowed not. to enter dialogue with the, with the the town's control. Did you hear that, David? Yeah, I keep hearing it. It seems like we got new rules, but I get you. Well, I've been a little bit lax in the in the past, and we're trying to get a little. Oh uh, well, I wouldn't blame you for me. Yeah. Uh, I'll try to pick up a question somewhere else in the meeting. Thank you, though. Yep. He's gone. Oh, any others? Uh, we're back to council. I'll read the motion. Mm -hmm. uh, motion to approve the engagement letter with Wedbush Securities Inc. to serve as municipal advisor to the town of Cave Creek on a WIFA loan to be refunded. Second. All right. Comment? No, it's a, <laughs> we're, um, we're grateful to have their expertise. Other than it's a road to save money. All right, uh, this, is, this is definitely financial. Can we get a roll call, please? Council Member Morris. Yes. Council Member McGuire. Yes. Vice Mayor Smith. Yes. Council Member Diefenderfer. Yes. Council Member Sova. 
Yes. Council Member Royer? Yes. Mayor Bunch? Uh, yes, motion carries uh, 7 0. Agenda item number two. Council approval of resolution number R2021-15, resolution of the Mayor and Town Council of the Town of Cave Creek, Arizona, authorizing the execution and delivery of an agreement and a trust agreement, approving the sale, execution, and delivery of excise tax revenue refunding obligation series 2021B, evidencing a proportionate interest of the owners thereof in an agreement between the Town of Cave Creek, Arizona, and a trustee, and authorizing and ratifying the taking of all other actions necessary to the consummation of the transactions contemplated by this resolution. That's a lot to read. Pat Walker, would you speak on this? Sure, Mayor, members of the council, these are the details that were sent out to council on the refunding. Um, the savings is going to be around 800,000 and we're gonna save about 100,000 a year, which is what we need to save in utilities to help offset some of the, the subsidies that we have. And this is working towards that by doing this free refunding. Um, but Jim's here to answer any questions about the numbers that he provided you, as well as Tim Stratton. Councilman Morris. Yeah, I, I noticed that we're pledging uh, uh, two times the excise tax on this. Um, and uh, uh, Pat, keep, keep that in mind, because I know that the, that pledge uh, is into play in other potential contracts we may do later. Uh, but I'm wondering, why are we pledging um, excise taxes on a utility system that has revenues? Why, why aren't we pledging uh, utility revenues? Why Jim, you want to take that one or you want, want me to sure. start? Okay. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Pat. Um, the, the new loan is a mirror image of the existing loan. So the existing loan that you have with WIFA has a pledge of excise taxes. And um, your utility revenue is not sufficient to produce coverage that is acceptable to the WIFA folks. And in the event that we were using a uh, utility pledge, um, we wouldn't be able to have released the reserve fund. If you remember, one of the actions that we took in February, March was to release your reserve funds for your loans that you have with WIFA because you have excellent coverage on your excise tax debt, um, you're able to release the reserve requirements. The, the pledge is in the event that there's some issue with trying to make a collection, make a payment to WIFA, that the intended repayment source is the utility. Now, the, the reality is that to some extent, operationally, the uh, general fund is subsidizing the wastewater utility, um, but the the intent is to repay wastewater debt with wastewater utility revenue. What the savings is going to do is going to reduce the amount of general fund subsidy. So to the extent that we have $100,000 a year of savings, you'll be able to reduce down the general fund contribution to the utility system um, each year. Yes, and it, uh, the the wastewater system is probably the worst one. We have the, we have the uh, poorest um, revenue uh, situation compared to debt. Uh, Pat, is this um, is this consistent with what we've been talking about with these other contracts? Yes, it is. Yeah, are we going to have enough excise income to cover this and any proposed actions there? Well, if I if I could, Pat, um, what we're doing is replacing existing debt with new debt and the new debt will be $100,000 less than the old debt. And so in terms of impact financially, your coverage actually will get better by doing this. If, if, you, if you didn't do anything, um, your coverage would be uh, not as good as if you do the refinancing and save $100,000 more per year. So it only improves whatever else you're doing. It doesn't, it, we're not adding this. This is not new. It's not a new pledge. It's an existing pledge that's being replaced for the new loan. We're using the old pledge. Yes. And, and to further answer your question, council member Morris, um, the, if anything is uh, pledged on excise taxes in the future, it can be pledged as a subordinate lien. So it wouldn't have anything to do with where we were before with this 
um, other than we're saving $100,000 a year on the debt service payment, but anything that would be proposed in the future for um, any debt would be a subordinate lien. Okay. Vice Mayor? Uh, in the existing WIFA agreement, there is a requirement for a uh, repair and replace uh, reserve. Is there in this, uh, will there be a repair and replace reserve requirement in this, or will it free up some uh, money for the, the town's utilization? Tim, could you answer that? Yeah, correct. Uh, th there won't, will not be a requirement for a reserve uh, and replacement fund for the excise tax bonds because we, in essence, are, you know, that's something that comes from WIFA as part of the old deal. Because these new bonds are based on your excise tax pledge, we will theoretically free up that money because you won't have to maintain uh, for these new bonds uh, a repair and replacement fund. Yeah. Yeah. So we'll have um, X number of dollars available. Um, I was just looking for a simple answer. I, yeah. You know. uh, Mayor and Council, um, I think the way that the repair and replacement reserve has worked is that you're required to put so much back into your system every year, and because of the amount of money that Cave Creek has put back into their systems, they've always met that requirement. So there's not going to be money freed up per se. It's just that I guess the test isn't there anymore. Is that correct, Tim? Yeah, that that's correct, Pat. There's no requirement for that test. Okay, so we're, we're basically to, taking WIFA out of the out of the. Have area. to hold uh, six or seven hundred thousand dollars off to the side in violet, uh, uh, just in case uh, somebody comes along and says, "Where's the uh, R and R reserve?" Right, so we're good, Mayor and Council Member. Mm -hmm. All right, anything else from Council? There's public comment on this one. I do believe that Mr. Uh, Phelps had a number two on this one as well. Uh, oh. This is David Phelps. My only comment would be, not a question, of course, I very much appreciate the town council leading on this uh, discussion with questions to help us understand these complex financing arrangements. I'm a little bit flustered because uh, when we were younger, we paid the private mortgage insurance and I feel like we're being made to pay the private mortgage insurance even though we've never missed a bill, we've never missed a payment. We do save reserves uh, innately but we do, we are running the plant better than it's ever been run before. There are more people using the plant than it's ever been used before. And I feel like we're paying, we're doing a great job on the rate, but we're doing a bad job on the terms. And I just really wish that we could carve out some of these uh, TPT encumbrances that are required for borrowing this kind of money you know, we're in over 50% ownership position. I'm just perplexed as to how this, what I'm going to call usury continues and, you know, how somebody hasn't figured out how to get around it, I guess. All right. That's not a question. That's a comment. Thank you. All right. We're back. Uh, any, anybody else on that one? No, we're back to council. I'll read the motion. Council approval of resolution number R2021-15, a resolution of the mayor and town council of the town of Cave Creek, Arizona, authorizing the execution and delivery of an agreement and a trust agreement, approving the sale, execution and delivery of excise tax revenue refunding obligations. Series 2021B, evidencing a proportionate interest of the owners thereof in an agreement between the town of Cave Creek, Arizona and a trustee and authorizing and ratifying the taking of all other actions necessary to the consummation of the transactions contemplated by this resolution. Second. Second. Comment, Councilman Ray? No, I, uh, I think again that this is um, a good transaction for this town and uh, we're saving some money and I appreciate uh, 
the work that went into it. Okay. Uh, this is uh, certainly an appropriate action to take considering the, uh, the fact that uh, interest rates are still relatively low. Uh, we would be remiss if we didn't do this. Well, it's always enjoyable to spend money, 50000 when basically the net result is you're saving seven hundred and fifty. Right. I'll right. always take those. Uh, and, 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 and this is basically like a refinance charge, and these yeah. folks are handling the transaction for us with WIFA. Councilman Morris? Yeah, I, I, th this is slam dunk, um, and, and it's... Uh, I look at it as it's it's more than one firefighter <laughs> because it's, this this continues on for eight years, and I I want to compliment staff, uh, Pat. You're, you're the representative, so I compliment you on the initiative in bringing this forward. It's another good one. Agree. Thank you, Pat. And this one obviously is uh, financial as well. So, roll call, please. <clears throat> Council Member McGuire. Yes. Vice Mayor Smith. Yes. Council Member Diefenderfer. Yes. Council Member Silva. Yes. Council Member Royer. Yes. Council Member Morris. Yes. Mayor Bunch. Oh, uh, yes. Motion carries 7 0. We're on to agenda item number three. Council consideration possible approval resolution number R2021 14, a resolution of the mayor and council of the town of Cape Creek, Arizona, appointing the town of Cape Creek town manager, Carrie Direct, as chief financial officer of the town for the purpose of submitting the annual expenditure limitation report to the Arizona Auditor General's Office for the fiscal year 2022. Pat? Mayor, members of the council, this is a state statute requirement. Um, every year there's an alternative expenditure limitation report that's due uh, to um, the Auditor General. And um, the person that's the official chief financial officer appointed by council is the one that has to sign that report and attest to its accuracy. And so um, you, you currently don't have a chief financial officer per se. So it's normal that the city manager or town manager would be appointed to that position in order to sign that report. And you have to do so every year by July 31st. Questions? We're just well, beating the deadline. Sound like our hands are, <laughs> sound like our arms are twisted behind our backs and, and we've got to yell uncle here. Uh, Gary's not here to defend Gary's herself. not here to defend herself, right, Tom. Um, there's public comment on this one? Nope, we're back to council for a motion, please. Uh, Vice Mayor? Okay, motion to approve resolution number R2021-14, a resolution of the mayor and town council of the town of Cave Creek, Arizona, appointing the town of Cave Creek town manager, Kerry Direct, as chief financial officer of the town for purpose of submitting the annual expenditure limitation report to the Arizona Auditor General's Office for the fiscal year 2022. Second. Our arms are behind our back, right? <laughs> I, I, I really think we should uh, put as much responsibility on, on her shoulders <laughs> as possible. Yeah. Oh. Uh, let's do the roll on this one too. We got it, we got it going good. Yes. Council Member Diefenderfer. Yes. Council Member Sova. Yes. Council Member Royer. Yes. Council Member Morris. Yes. Council Member McGuire. Yes. Vice Mayor or er, Mayor Bunch. <laughs> I thought I got. I, 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 yes. Yes. Uh, motion carries seven uh, seven zero. Uh, Pat, thank you for hanging around tonight. We appreciate it. You know. Welcome, uh, Council. Yeah. It's always a pleasure uh, uh, having you present to us. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, agenda item number four, council discussion, possible approval of resolution number R2021-16, authorizing the town manager to execute an agreement and implementing documentation, binding the town to pay costs associated with an allocation of 386 acre feet per year of non-Indian agricultural, parents NIA, close parents, central Arizona project water. Uh, Michelle, uh, I think I met you in Tucson two years ago. Uh -huh. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Um, we do have, um, uh, besides myself, we have Michelle Van Quethen, who is actually helping uh, the town in uh, water resource issues, uh, legal issues on the um, I'll go through a presentation to sort of explain what uh, this water is about, uh, what's going on, and then Michelle can correct all the mistakes I make. So. <laughs> that, that'll work. <laughs> mm -hmm. I could use that. 
Next slide. Hey, Sean, would you put the microphone a little bit closer to you? Okay. So uh, going back a little ways, uh, you know, when the uh, state got uh, Central Arizona Project water, uh, Colorado River water, uh, in 1983, the, there was an allocation uh, where it was uh, basically divided up. And I'll show a slide later, which shows the, sort of the priority levels. So as part of that time, that's when the allocations like the municipal industrial uh, water allocation that was given to Cape Cook Water Company at the time went through. And there's also uh, Indian communities and non-Indian agricultural users were given allocations. Um, over time, not all of the um, uh, non-Indian agricultural uh, uh, groups actually utilized all their allocation. Um, but just to give you uh, feedback, uh, the town's allocation is 2,606 acre feet of municipal and industrial priority water. Um, one acre foot is about 325,000 gallons of water. Uh, in the last calendar year, 2020, we did not use all that allocation. So we used, um, I think it came up earlier, just about 20, just under 2,200 acre feet of that water. And that went uh, about 1,500 acre feet, uh, went to uh, providing water services in Cave Creek. And that's also for the carefree customers directly connected to our system. We sent 336 acre feet to Desert Hills to help supplement the system out there. And then we sent uh, just under 49 acre feet of, of, of raw cap water to Rancho Mignano to meet our contractual obligations uh, with them. Um, so I, I will point out, as I point out my other presentation, uh, the 2606 is our current number. It is currently in flux. The fact that uh, 378 acre feet of that is actually gonna be uh, transferred to Carefree Water Company as part of the settlement agreement for separating the water systems. Next slide, Brian. Um, so as I said, you know, in 1983, when the allocations were being divvied up, uh, uh, one of the priorities was called non-Indian agricultural water, NIA water. Um, and then some of the agencies that, uh, uh, um, that did re uh, receive it did not use, utilize all their allocations. So over a number of years, they did not continue to use that reallocation. So in 2013, Arizona Department of Water Resources started to look at a process to actually uh, firmed that water up and, and offered that up. Um, and in uh, 2013, the town actually saw that as an opportunity to secure water resources for Desert Hills. Um, so when the town purchased Desert Hills water system, one of the first things the master plan had pointed out is that it was a, a groundwater-based water system. Um, they actually were uh, getting a transfer of some water from uh, basically a bulk water sale from the Cave Creek Water Company at the time uh, through the Cloud Road uh, water line and interconnect site at 24th Street. Uh, but they did not have what was referred to as a secure um, and a renewable uh, surface water supply. Um, so when the application went through in, in June of uh, 2013, there was a resolution the town council put in place, and it was really put aside to create a, a water resource for Desert Hills that didn't exist uh, off of for CAP water allocation. Um, and uh, at the time, uh, there was a, a thought that there more water would be available. So the application resolution uh, actually allowed for up to 1,300 acre feet of, of uh, NIA water. And the cost of uh, uh, one uh, 1,388 acre feet, that actually was just the capital cost associated with the water. That was what the estimate was back in 2013. So like anything in water resources, it takes a number of years. And uh, now we're in 2021. And now finally, we're coming to a conclusion of an application process that the, 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 the town and uh, ADWR had started back in 2013. Next slide, Brian. So it was just this. Uh, um, January that we've got notified that uh, oh, we would actually be getting an allocation of 386 acre feet and there's a letter associated with the package that shows the uh, the cost associated with that I think we received that uh, letter uh, in May I believe it was um, so instead of the 1300 acre feet of water uh, of, of now Indian agricultural priority water we're looking at 386 acre feet which is less than what we typically have been transferring the last two years to to um, the Desert Hills water system uh, but it is getting fairly close. Um, and it does, again, it provides the, a new uh, central Arizona project, uh, Colorado River Water Supply for uh, uh, Desert Hills. And I'll just jump in right now and say, you know, with the uh, potential shortages on the system, that is something that we are considering. But it, it does, again, provides a, a surface water supply that currently Desert Hills does not have. Um, the cost uh, total is uh, $1,961.51 uh, uh, for a total of, of um, 
uh, just under $800,000 for the water. That's made up of two components. One is the back capital costs and one is some other uh, operational costs. When I say back capital costs, when, uh, when we pay for our current CAP allocation, it actually has two components. One is that uh, as water users, we're all paying for a proportional share of the cost of constructing a multi-billion dollar facility, the Central Arizona project and the 300 plus uh, miles of canal and the booster pump station. So uh, they, they uh, distribute that um, against all the water orders placed. And then you also play an operational cost for moving that water. The water itself doesn't have a, a cost to it. You're actually paying for, again, the, the facilities to move that and then the cost of running those facilities in effect. Um, <clears throat> It, well, the option we were given at the time, uh, we could either make a lump sum payment uh, for $757,000, or we could spread those over five equal installments uh, for 2.5% uh, interest uh, at $788,000, to, uh, just under uh, 559. So that's what we've built into this year's budget proposal. Uh, we added it into the water resource fund within the town's operational budget. Um, and that's that the, the first payment is identified within that. So the actual, this is just paying for the back costs. So as we move forward, if we do place an order because uh, the, um, the delivery schedule for CAP water is that they do it by calendar year and we work on a fiscal year budget uh, that we'd place the order. And currently all of the funds for the cap orders are actually in the Cave Creek Water Company. So that's something we'll have to work on is, is moving forward, we can transfer some of that in. But in fact, I look at it as we'll have to be placing two orders. We'll place a, um, a, a CAP order for uh, Cave Creek and we'll pay, uh, place a CAP uh, order, a separate CAP order for Desert Hills. Uh, the one question we have this year is they've, they've uh, because of the potential shortage, we believe next year, uh, we uh, are most likely if we pursue this and move forward with it, get the 386 acre feet that that money, those, that amount of water would be available. If the drought continues and shortages uh, proceed following years, that might lessen. Um, but so it's not as high a priority, but it is, it is a water supply. Next slide, Brian. So why is the, one of the pros is that again, uh, uh, as I indicated in my presentation earlier, and I've talked to council before about is the the groundwater uh, uh, the groundwater uh, that um, Desert Hills has available to it and the, the the three existing walls that we have functionally out there, the groundwater table is dropping and the amount of water available uh, as the walls uh, uh, the groundwater drops is decreasing more rapidly than just you would expect just because it is a shallow basin up there and it doesn't recharge itself very much. So the town does run the Desert Hill system. We have just over 1,700 accounts and we do have an obligation to provide water for these uh, customers. So this is part of an overall water portfolio solution for the town trying to bring this together. Um, the NAA water, non Indian agricultural water, while, while being a lesser priority than our municipal industrial is still a surface water supply. Um, and uh, right now, Michelle can let me know if I'm, I'm mistaken, but I think that the cost is there's been some other discussions about trying to buy a more secure or a higher priority water allocation, and it could be as, as expensive as fifteen to twenty thousand dollars per acre foot to buy a higher priority water right now. So um, it's not cheap water resources, and it's just something that we have to, to balance out. And again, when you talk about water portfolios, again, we're not using all of our allocation right now. I know there's been discussion since I've been here about trying to uh, uh, look at recharging and doing some uh, water banking. We have not uh, been able to get that done, probably just because of resource availability myself. Um, but that is something that you, you know, when you talk about water resources, you have to have a long-term vision of what you're trying to deal with. You don't. You need to look out of what what the, the system would be building out and what you would be needing. So I just point that out. Um, uh, we already, the town already has the infrastructure to deliver uh, the water so we can move it up the pipeline. We actually have treatment capacity right now. And again, we can either expand that capacity or, or, or combine it with our city of Phoenix connection to deliver it to it. So uh, we, we have a lot of pluses for it. And then uh, long term, there is an opportunity to bring this in to, uh, again, right now we're supplying over 600 acre feet a year to Desert Hills to help supplement their system. And that is one of the reasons why the town elected to move forward in 2017 with a water policy to, to uh, I hate to say restrict, but it does provide some restrictions on, on growth in the system because we couldn't uh, secure up and firm up all the water resources. So this gives us another uh, tool. It's not, again, security isn't there with the drought continuing. It's gonna take a long time to, and I'm not sure what the final results are gonna be, but it's another uh, uh, tool in our water resource chest as we move forward. 
Next slide. Um, so when I talk about priorities, and I should, probably should have brought this up a little earlier, you'll see here, this is sort of the, the common graphic you'll see uh, when you talk about the CAP. Uh, it's sort of shaped like the canal itself. And as the water drops, the, the lowest priority waters at the top, you can see the excess water is the, the, the least secure. It's, it's done on sort of one-time basis once available. Then you have the agricultural pool below that. The NIA water is the yellow bar on that. And then below that is the municipal and industrial, the M&I water. Um, so again, that's the most secure. At this point, uh, we've been told uh, there, there's going to be a declared shortage, a tier one shortage um, for calendar year 2022 on the Central Azurma Project Canal. Uh, we believe it may be dipping into the NNI water allocation, but they've said at this point that we anticipate that we would, if we proceed with this, we'd still be able to we'll most likely get the 386 next year. The following year, if it still continues, then that will start to drop and then the NIA water will become less, more vulnerable to outages. So there will be reductions on it. So uh, while we'll be paying for some of the water, we might not be able to get all of it. And when I say we pay for it, when we, you have a water allocation, you do still have to continue. We have to pay the back and the resolution tonight is to allow us to enter into the contract. And part of that is the financial obligation of paying the back capital charges on the water. But moving forward, once this water is in our portfolio, there's an obligation that we continue to pay the capital uh, charges on this. If you don't use it, then you don't pay the operational component on it. And it's something that gets balanced out at the end of the year. So it, there will be an ongoing cost to this, uh, but again, it does add to our overall water portfolio. Next slide. So I want to you know, highlight some of the cons. I've talked about a few. Um, uh, again, we do continue to have those capital costs moving forward. Um, the NIA water, when the town entered into the 2013 request for this water, there was a thought working with Arizona Department of Water Resources that up to 70% of the water at the time that Arizona Department of Water Resources would, would uh, consider it secure enough that it could be used to uh, issue long-term uh, certificates of assured water supply against. That has decreased to the point now that uh, ADWR basically won't consider this to secure water to issue certificates against. So it's uh, uh, we, in Desert Hills, there's only a handful of certificates and actually they're mostly towards groundwater. Um, there is no service water allocation, so there's none, no certificates for that. But uh, moving forward, I think that was one of the discussions that the 1300 acre feet was a number that came out of the 2008 to town's 2008 master plan and looked at what the future build out needs for the desert hills water system was that actually was a calculated number it wasn't just sort of a, a swing and a stab at it it was actually calculated um the uh uh you still have to if we don't use utilize the water you would have to come up with a solution uh to recharge it which is something that uh, we i mentioned earlier but we have put something in place but that's something i hope to with the upcoming integrated master plan to actually come up with a plan that we can put uh, both our excess uh, um, and municipal industrial allocation and or, you know, balance out our water system because, you know, things like Rancho Mignano when we're overflowing the lakes, it's just, it, it, it disturbs me that we're not doing something with that allocation. Uh, we can't directly and sell uh, m &I water, n and I water, but once we actually do, if we can come up with a, a process to store it and generate uh, storage credits on it, then that's something that uh, then we have an opportunity to do something with. And when I say long-term storage credits, that is, it is a long-term process we have to be, uh, deal with because uh, if we store it um, in a facility, how do you physically get access? How do we still get water into our pipes? Uh, you know, when we think about water resources, it's sort of like a three-legged stool. One's the physical paper water. Um, one is where it physically is. And the, and the last stool uh, piece of the puzzle is how you physically get it into your pipes. And we have to make sure that we have a, a system together that pulls all those pieces together so we're not falling on our, our butts. So, or I'm not falling on my butt. <laughs> so the process, next slide, Brian, is that tonight we're asking uh, Mayor and Council to adopt the resolution to allow us to enter into the final subcontract. So the draft, the final draft that we've been given from uh, a Central Zone Project is in the packet. There, uh, the resolution does allow for some minor changes, uh, which would we run through legal counsel before we do that. We're asking to get authority as staff and the mayor to execute the documents, move us forward. The next uh, thing, because it is actually a federal contract, it actually has to go through uh, judicial confirmation. Um, so there has to be a position, uh, uh, position, uh, eh. <laughs> It has to go forward to a federal uh, um, a judge. So that's something that we'd look to do with some of the other applicants and bring something forward. 
uh, could be up to 60 days to get that process. Uh, but we can't, we can, while well, we might be able to place the orders, they actually can't give us deliveries until that judicial confirmation. So that's why we're sort of at the tail end of the process for this year to get this put in place. Um, by the, uh, before October 1st, we'd be placing a water, a water order with Central Arizona Project for this water for Desert Hills for next year, next fiscal year. And then uh, moving forward, we'd be looking at, you know, how that affects, but uh, what we'd be doing operationally different was that instead of again, doing one order, which we do right now, we'd be placing the two orders and then trying to balance that out. That's something I'd like to talk with uh, Central Reserve Project about because if, if there is, a, if we put in for the 386 acre feet and we can't get all of it, we have to make sure that we can back that up with our, our, um, um, our Cape Creek supplies. There is some budgeting, we can allow some buffering. So I think it'll work out in our favor and it work out uh, and then again, right now we will moving forward, we will have to adjust some budgets, uh, right now, as I mentioned, the, all of the funding, uh, to pay for the cap water, CFP water allocation does show up in the Cape Creek water system. So for next year's budget, we'll, uh, and we'll potentially look at doing a transfer this year as well. If this is, if council elects to move forward with this, we'll probably put a line item or we will put a line item in desert Hills so that they pay for that water directly. We could do it through the bulk water charge between the water companies, which we're doing now, but that was more set up, uh, uh with last year's rate model to more pay for uh, capital expenditures, past capital expenditures. So, but we'll look at how we do it. Uh, the money was identified in the, a water resource fund, uh, which was newly created two years ago. Um, so we'll have to, again, we'll properly appropriate this, that it should, or the thought is we're moving forward and we're actually just gonna be charged to Desert Hills. So the Desert Hills users will have to pay for this. And we'll have to build that into the rate study we're currently doing to see what the effects are as well as you know, moving forward and, and the variability is something that is concerning, but right now with the drought that's going on in, the, in this uh, Colorado River, you know, uh, you know, we have to look long-term and potentially if it's not available now, it could be available in the future, but you know, it, it's hard. So with that, I can answer any questions uh, council may have. Vice Mayor. Yeah, I have, a, I have a couple of questions and probably intermix with the questions would be some notices of potential policy making. Uh, what we're doing here is we're talking about is, uh, uh, is it buying an entitlement? Because I think allocation is not the correct word. It's usually an uh, entitlement to water. Are we buying an entitlement, the NIA water? I can, yeah, I can take that. The, um, it is actually called an allocation and it is a contract right but it's generally considered a permanent right that's based on a lot of rulemaking. So it's, it's pretty solid. The actual term of the contract is, is 100 years, but it's probably going to be renewed with no problem. If the NIA water is taken away from, if we ever get it, if the NIA water is taken away, uh, does that mean that we no longer have to pay for the allocation? There's a process for a provider to essentially sell its um, allocation to another provider, and you have to go through a public review process to see if it meets the terms of the original allocation, which is usually some sort of public interest determination, but we've had that happen with M&I contracts throughout the Phoenix area, where some small companies didn't want to keep paying for it so they would transfer it to another. The, um, I just want to say that, you know, this is difficult. You guys have a dis difficult decision because we don't know what the reliability of this source is going to be. You cannot assume that Desert Hills will have water every year because of this contract. The, the best use of this water would be to store it when it's available and have it underground. And then hopefully it's available enough to use it on a more consistent basis from an underground storage source. The, um, however, you know, the cost is relatively low, but you do need to consider there are ongoing costs. The current capital charge, I believe, is right around $50 or $60 an acre foot per year. So it looks like it'd be, you know, around $20,000 per year just to have it. That's what you pay, you know, just to have it. Um, but it's water and there are very few ways to get water. And so, you know, from a water attorney standpoint, you take water and you ask questions later, but <laughs> it's going to not be there every year. So I understand as uh, 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 council member Morris used to say years ago, it's desert gold. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that, that's history. Uh, Will the cost of withdrawing the water from the Cap Canal be the same as withdrawing 
any other water from the Cap Canal. Yeah, the rates are the same. So uh, from a contractual standpoint, it is the same cost as our municipal industrial water. Okay. Um, and I don't know, is, I'll put it this way. Is there work underway consideration of how this will affect the water rates for uh, desert hills since personally I see very little advantage to the town paying for desert hills extra for desert hills water. To answer your question, I thought Pat was going to stay on because I've been having correspondence with her since uh, Thursday, but it, yeah, it, it wasn't fully built into the last rate model because that was completed last summer. So we plan to move forward with it. Just doing some general numbers, it ends up being, oh, Pat's there. It, it, just the raw numbers, spreading it out, it's like $7 per user per month type of thing. But that's something with the rate model uh, that's ongoing right now, we want to look at a little more closely. How, how, how can we distribute this money? Um, since it is a long-term uh, purchase, do we have to uh, cash fund it? Is there other ways of funding this? And stuff? So that's something we have to pursue. We, so we don't have that uh, uh, final answer for council. Yeah, I wasn't really asking, yeah. looking for a long discussion. Yeah. I was more <laughs> making a point. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, Vice Mayor. I know I'm not supposed to do that. <laughs> if, I, if I can interrupt and build on your question, I'm, I'm not quite so sure I understand these numbers. The $1,399 per acre foot, I'm assuming by your write up here, Sean, that is not a one time charge. I'm assuming, or am I wrong in assuming that's a, a yearly charge? Am I correct or incorrect? Um, the the 1300 uh, so the five years was for the, for the uh, 20, the, the past capital expenditures. A two thousand and eighty-three dollars, uh, which comes out times your three hundred and eighty-six acre feet. That's eight hundred and four thousand dollars over five years. That's a hundred and sixty thousand per year. So, I, I guess I'm I'm having trouble trying to connect the dots on the yeah. numbers. Uh, the again, the thirteen ninety-nine per acre foot. Mm -hmm. Uh, that comes out to be 500 and call it $60,000. Is that a one-time charge or is that paid yearly? That 1399 that was originally anticipated and now that's actually dropped to uh, $1,295, uh, $96. That is the back capital cost on that water. So as I indicated, well, no. when the Central Arizona project was constructed, they tried to just structure it that it was the users with the allocations that were paying the back charges since this municipal industrial water was not fully allocated, not everybody was using it. There's there's some back due payments in effect that we're having to pay for. But then I don't moving forward, I'm asking the question yeah. in the right way. Then so once there, once this payment once these payments are made, then moving forward, it's really just a, a fifty dollar. I think it's, it's it's fifty or fifty four dollars per acre foot is the ongoing capital cost per acre foot moving okay. forward. Uh, we're paying off the old debt on the on this water. Okay, on page 52, this is in our package of 137. Mm -hmm. it, uh, to request not more than 1,300 acre feet at a cost of 1,399. Mm -hmm. Well, obviously it's gonna be 386. Uh, the way I read that, that's the initial cost for the water. Uh, what I'm asking is, and then on page 53 of 157 in the third paragraph, uh, it's talking about uh, paying uh, the back charges, capital charges, which in, in here says 2083, and you said it's been reduced. Could I take a stab at it? Yeah. So, so the 1388 that you were looking at, the charge, that was an old estimate that the previous town council was using for the cost of the water that no longer applies. The, the final cost of the water is presented um, for your decision is on the slide that says final reallocation decision. That consists of two components. And what this was, was it was water that was allocated originally in the 80s to the Pinal farmers. 
and they didn't want to pay for it, so they wanted to give it back. So we are making up the capital charges that the farmers did not pay for that allocation so that it will be even and then start paying, you know, the $50 per year foot or whatever they set it at every year. So that is just just filling in the amount that was unpaid associated with this water allocation of 386 acre feet. The $665 charge is added onto that and it's called NIA charges in the slide, but what that is is a settlement amount that was paid to the farmers in consideration of infrastructure that they built in their area for this water because it was going to be taken away from them. And so, it, this is really a settlement amount to get the allocation reallocated. So the upfront charge will be the 1961.50 per acre foot. That'll be a one-time charge, although you could pay it as Sean indicated over five years. That's only once. Then every year, if Sean doesn't order water, you pay the capital charge for 386 feet acre feet, or if it's not available, you still pay the capital charge for 386 acre feet. And like I said, currently it's 50 or $60 per acre foot, and that goes on forever. If you order and successfully get 386 acre feet in a year, there's also an operational and maintenance charge that reflects the cost to pump that water to you through the canal. That's the same as you pay for your existing CAP allocation. Okay, let, let me ask this. Uh, Sean, in, in his presentation, said that he has a number of $788,559. Mm -hmm. And he says it can be paid in five equal annual installments uh, at two and a half percent interest. My question is that $788,000, if we were to pay that in a lump sum now, not over five years, added on to the, uh, the other fees, uh, that's the total that we would pay out now, correct? It'd be $757,000. So if we paid it in a lump sum- We saved the 2.5% interest we, for the five years. We'd write a check for 788 no, and we would be- 757. Entitled based on availability, 386 acre feet. Correct. And then in subsequent years, the only cost we would have is then the 50 or $60 per acre foot multiplied by no more than 386, if it were a lesser allocation. Is that correct? Correct, yeah. Okay. So you either have a lump sum payment or uh, again, the option that we're proposing is to do spread it over five years and, and their uh, interest rate is two and a half percent is what they've, they've offered to us for spreading those payments over. And then once that, paying off the back back debt that's due on that water, then it's just a $50 per acre foot moving forward. And, my, and if we use it, then we- reading yeah. this, the way I took it yeah. is, you only have one opportunity to buy into this game and it's now. Uh, you can't come back in a year or two and say, I'd right. like to get into it now. That's that's our understanding with talking with CAP. It's it's taken a long time to come to this uh, process. Um, you know, it, it's sad that it's coming at the same time as, as we are looking at uh, potentially the first shortages on the, uh, the cap water supply. Uh, but, you know, the water world is, is a long-term game in, in effect. Um, so, uh, yeah, what they've been told is that if we don't ask for this, then they will offer it up to the other uh, people who made their allocations, who in most cases ask for more water than they're currently getting. So I'm assuming it'll be absorbed. I believe there's 20 other recipients in total. So the CAP will just take this water. And then if we don't enter in this contract this year, it'll go away and it won't be available next year for us okay, to go so after. Just so it's crystal yeah. clear in my mind, if yeah. we, and I, I I would suggest we go ahead with the five-year payment, mm -hmm. uh, which would come out to be approximately uh, $160,000 a year. Or, or, or right now, we'd write a check for 160, mm -hmm. and then what would be the total amount for uh, the initial buy-in? Well, the 160 is our first year. Uh, uh, payment and then we do a, a monthly payment for the water that we use or the the fifty dollars per three hundred eighty. Uh, okay, per so so I'm wrong in per annual, multiplying thirteen ninety nine or a lesser amount times three eighty six. That's not applicable anymore. 
Yeah, I, I apologize for that's the confusion just because I've, I've tried to put some history into the uh, the council report and the, the, um, the 399 should have been, uh, or 1399 should have been 1388 on the first page. So that's actually the resolution. I was just trying to provide the history at the time that the application was made in 2013. That's what uh, was being presented. Okay. Is, is so what was if going. we decide to go forward with this using the five payment plan, yeah. what will our 2021 payment be approximately it's a hundred and it's one hundred sixty eight thousand dollars i believe okay okay and um, then subsequently yeah. it'd be one hundred and sixty thousand plus the usage for another four four subsequent years and yes for the back capital costs okay yeah thank you yeah councilman morris I'm going to show my conspiratorial side here, um, <laughs> but this is a question. We asked for this water 15 years ago, thereabouts, and it's, we've been waiting on it ever since I've had anything to do with the town and the water companies. And just when there's no water or there may not be any water, now it's there. We got to make a decision right now or it's gone. Doesn't that seem a little odd to anybody else that there's something going on in the background that uh, maybe Michelle wants to take that one? <laughs> and we, I mean, we've been watching this process for years, so we knew it was coming. It may, it may be, you know, that you aren't watching it like we are. <laughs> Unfortunately, it's ad nauseum. I think probably Catherine used to see it a little bit. <laughs> so there is, is there something else going? Is, is somebody behind this? The farmers or what? I mean, why, why when the water is just about to be um, allocated, why is it suddenly an emergency uh, to, uh, it's suddenly made available and you have to pay for it right away? It's taken them so long. I think people are really impatient to get it done, probably. And they want to be able to give it out by 2022. They made promises a few years ago to, to meet the deadline and they got up against the deadline because it took them so long to work it through with the federal government and everybody who had to be involved. Hmm. Perhaps okay. Bob, well, there's no answer, right? No, no, yeah, yeah, I have an answer. answer. Maybe it's to pay for the back capital charges. <laughs> I, I, I noticed from your chart, it would appear that uh, the, well, the, you know, the, the, the one that with the uh, green, orange, blue, and some other color, it would indicate that the first jeopardy is the ag water, and that is before the NIA. Mm -hmm. And my understanding is there's an awful lot of ag water. So they have to, we'd have to go through that before they start cutting the NIA? Yeah, the, the ag pool water is actually water that is not allocated. It was a special program designed to help those farmers that didn't want to have the allocation be responsible for the payments is my understanding. So that was set to go away when everybody else, like the Indian communities started using more of their water, but the ag pool is really excess. It's, it's just stuff that other people aren't using. So that will go away just because people will start using their, their water. NIA is actually an allocation. So if the water's there, then there are people with their names on it and they have a subcontract. But you're right, if, if there's a shortage, it goes from the top down. So the NIA will go completely away before any city um, like Cave Creek will see a shortage in their MNI allocation. Okay. It just looks to me like the so-called long-term contracts would be more protected than the so-called excess. Oh, absolutely. Um, so. That's why, again, at this point, our understanding is the, the market rate for that, trying to buy that higher priority, uh, uh, more secure water is much more substantial, uh, you know, $15,000, $20,000 per acre foot. And then you pay the ongoing cost, but, you know, the, the upfront. If, if it's even available, yeah. Uh, Sean, what, uh, how many cities and towns do you estimate are going to partake in this? Um, I believe we got a copy of the list and it wasn't in the package, but I, I believe it's almost, it's like 20 applicants total that are getting a portion of this. Out of 90 plus 
Even, even Carefree is getting some. Yeah, Carefree is one of the potential recipients. They still have to enter into a subcontract. I think uh, Queen Creek was on there. I thought that's saw Peoria, but um, yeah, I, I can't remember. Wasn't. And in your opinion, do you think everybody being offered this will accept it? I I do. You know, I actually had a, a conversation with uh, uh, my counterpart, Greg Crossman, and he's, he's trying to bring it to his board. And the thought is that, uh, as it was mentioned, is you, you don't you, you you pay for water and you ask questions later type of thing. You, you add it to your portfolio and you can work on how to how to uh, generate storage credits or do something like that first. You know, water is desert gold. It was a, it, that's actually a really good way to describe it. So how do you best utilize that? And water resources is is a long term game. So if you can get some water and you can put it in, as Michelle indicated, if we put it in the ground and we can and we recharge it, we do have to figure out the full mechanism um, how that would work. But I, I personally think it's it's a good good solution uh, to a problem we currently have. That you know we have a we are running a, a water company that currently has does not have a renewable water uh, uh, supply in the uh, surface water or even a, you know another renewable type of water supply. It's reliant 100% on groundwater, and we're back feeding it with our main system allocation. <clears throat> Refresh my memory. There's there's 18 uh, proposed recipients. Oh, because 18, I thought it was 20, okay. And uh, refresh my memory, why is it only 18 and not more? Uh, I'm not sure, Michelle, if you know that back in 2013 when it became available, I'm not sure if everybody else had other solutions in place. A lot of other jurisdictions have been doing a lot more things with water banking and, and uh, a recharge over the years. You know, a lot of other jurisdictions, the two other jurisdictions I worked with in the Valley, uh, both, um, you know, we did, they didn't have subcontracts for uh, uh, their effluent from their uh, wastewater treatment plants. So they actually put it in the ground and generate long-term storage credits from them since they came up with a full water portfolio. So uh, I'm not sure why the 18. Michelle, do you have any more history on that? Or no? I think it was just a cost benefit analysis by the people who filed applications. I think if you look at the, most of the people on that list need water. <laughs> So I would, I would think that went into the equation when they were determining whether to apply. I'd, I'd like to take a, a run at this whole concept and simplify it if I can. We have a short period of time to buy a car. We buy this car and then we continue, we pay it off in five years. And, but we, in that whole time, we continue to pay the registration, the insurance. And on the years that the gas station has gasoline, we get to drive that car somewhere. If they don't have gasoline, we don't get to drive it. That's the same as what we're doing here exactly. Mm. Yeah, I just had to simplify that. I mean, it's one of those easy ways of looking at it. So it's, it's uh, more understandable for anybody who might be watching online. I think we figured it out here. Um, <laughs> Mr. Mayor, I have, a, I have a question. One of you asked, Sean, about using your gas station analogy. Yep. <laughs> when will Desert Hills pay, if any? And my question is, and, and, and Pat, you jumped in to, to answer, but I do have a question. As I see it, there's three components of payment. One, the upfront sunk cost for capital. Two, the annual backup fee for capital if not used. And three, the operational. I can see the third, the gas you're consuming at the gas station would be chargeable to Desert Hills. My question for Pat, and is there anything we need to do in documenting this now? How much of the capital can be allocated to Desert Hills, if any? I'm not sure if Pat's still on with us. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, she's gone. Yeah. I think we should do that in the future rate study. Well, I, I, I think, uh, Sean, my question is, does town staff recommend oh, that, that the costs of this all be put towards the Desert Hills rates? And we've got two $500,000 water tanks to fix. Now we've got uh, 788,000 over five years, perhaps. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, this, I mean, it's for their benefit. There is, mm -hmm. there's absolutely no justification or reason for the, uh, for the residents of Cape Creek to subsidize it, in my view, what a staff yeah. thing. Uh, I would agree that this should be uh, uh, paid for by the Desert Hills uh, customers. This is actually for their benefit. You know, right now the, the town there, the town's been in a, a good position since we bought and, and, and been operating both water companies and that uh, Cave Creek had a water allocation that has, it was um, uh, not being fully utilized. So we were able to transfer water between the companies to balance it out. But long-term as Cave Creek continues to grow, 
that water allocation is needed to support the land use and growth of Cave Creek, not uh, Desert Hills. So Desert Hills needs its own water resources. Thank you. Mayor, I'm on the phone. I just couldn't get to my mute button fast enough. <laughs> um, the way that it's set up now is that we charge a bulk water charge to Desert Hills, and that is calculated based on what it costs to provide that water per 1,000 gallons in, from Cave Creek. So we look at all the costs associated with providing the 1,000 gallons of water that Cave Creek pays. That's what we charge Desert Hills then. So it's six of one, half dozen the other. We can include that cost in that calculation for bulk water charges, or we can include it in the cost when we do the rate study and look at overall what's the revenue uh, needed for to sustain Desert Hills. So either way, it can be included in the cost and broken out that way. If we if we recharge, does that affect the reimbursement? If we use the money, the, the, the water for recharge? As far as the budget goes? No, as far as what we would include in the rate study for Desert Hills. <laughs> yes, we would look at that. Okay. Uh, even if we Mr. recharge, Attorney. it would still be for their benefit. It would be long-term short charge for Desert Hills Water Company. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Mr. Sams, I, yeah. I think your answer can be, or uh, your question can be answered uh, by making a comparison to lottery money. Lottery money is absolutely for education. You know very well it's spent for other things. So this is amorphous. Okay. I, I, I got to tell you this. I, I hate to do this, but I love to do it in another way. <laughs> when this first came up, the then uh, uh, utilities director, Jessica Marlowe, uh, came up with this proposal, went to uh, uh, the mayor and uh, council member uh, uh, Tom McGuire and said, I want to submit this to uh, the... Uh, the powers to be. I think that we will need water eventually. And she said, and, and the justification for it is Desert Hills. I know right now we're only giving them a small amount of water a year, but I know it's going to increase substantially. And so they bought that. And that was when this was submitted. And uh, I just... I just thought at the time, because uh, I talked to her about it, I said, you're really prescient. You, you know what's going to happen, don't you? And she said, yes, I do. That's why I'm going to go to Gilbert. <laughs> <laughs> Where she's now head of utilities. <laughs> With a good water portfolio. We, we got her money. <laughs> David mentioned that, you know, the original 1300 number uh, came from the, the original master plans when they looked at the certificated area for Desert Hills. And if you, you know, you, you look at what the build out was, was going to be, that's where that number came from. It was actually the assumed uh, build out demand for Desert Hills. We good here? Yes. We ready to go to public comment? <laughs> Phelps, I know you're, I know you're there listening. <laughs> Good evening, everybody. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I see this as just an incredible enjoyment to watch uh, Mr. Sullivan, Mr. Smith uh, jostle this strategy. Guys, this is a way to save $5 million if we need it. I understand it's a long-term thinking process, but nobody held a gun to our head to buy Desert Hills. Desert Hills has always been a waterless water company that we have supplanted water to. Ernie, I know you were there during the days when we had to do the emergency tie into them and how desperate water need was over there when we bought it. But uh, long and the short of it for me guys is, I fully didn't grasp this until I talked to uh, Councilman Royer and she kind of set me straight on ironing out for me the real needs for this and I thank her for that. I think it's a tremendous opportunity for us to help the neighbors in de Desert Hills and let them pay for it. Absolutely. Thank you. Thanks, David. We're back. To, is there any more? Jane, that's it. We're back to council. You need a motion, please? I'll read the motion. Oh. <laughs> motion to approve resolution number R2021-16. 
a resolution of the mayor and town council of the town of Cave Creek, Arizona, authorizing the town manager to execute an agreement and implementing documentation binding the town to pay costs associated with an allocation of 386 acre feet per year of non-Indian agriculture, NIA, Central Arizona Project Water. Second. Councilman? I think that there's no way that we could not take this water. Uh, water is Arizona's most precious natural resource. Whether we use it for desert hills or not, there's no way that we as the elected leaders of this community could turn it down. And it's an opportunity that we must accept. And I am thankful that we have the opportunity to do so. To build on the mayor's analogy of the car, knowing that there won't be gas all the time, when it's 110 outside in the summer, I'd rather be riding in a car than walking, <laughs> even if it's a part time. <laughs> so I'll factor that in my budget then. There you go. Not gas available. Any other comments? This one's definitely financial. Council Member Silva. Yes. Council Member Royer. Yes. Council Member Morris. Yes. Council Member McGuire. Yes. Vice Mayor Smith. Yes. Council Member Diefender. Yes. Mayor Bunch. Uh, yes. A motion carries seven nothing. Ah, uh, let's see here. Um, pardon? Thank you, Michelle. <laughs> Mayor, I'm really leaving now. Oh, <laughs> okay. I, you know, I, I just missed you before. I forgot. I forgot that you were uh, uh, had some interest in that other item. I, I, I appreciate your hanging around. <laughs> you bet. Thanks. Bye -bye. Uh, okay, let's go on to number six, uh, which is council approval of reimbursement request to access City of Phoenix water development fees to Cave Creek uh, Olson DG LLC for APN 211-46-340A Dutch Brothers Coffee commercial development. As indicated in section four, fees of the intergovernmental agreement IGA with City of Phoenix previously approved on November 28, 2018. Mayor, we still... just need to do it again, don't we, Sean? We do. We're How nearly, we're nearly is done. Is this the last one or is there more? There's one more last one. Uh, Brian, you want to bring up the presentation? Yeah. Presentation? Presentation? I got some we slides. I got some graphs. <laughs> uh, I just have to explain, explain it. So. Since we've inter introduced, anybody got an objection to paying them what we owe them? <laughs> <laughs> Well, the first oh, slide will show you. If, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, we might have to mortgage that car. Yeah. Okay, next slide, Brian. So, um, and just to clarify, the um, the actual uh, reimbursement, uh, we actually got uh, um, the resolution is with. Um, Cave Creek AZ Development Group LLC. We actually did receive documentation from them that the development right has been transferred to um, Cave Creek Olson uh, DG LLC. Oh, so. well, that changes everything. <laughs> <laughs> this, uh, the second slide, Ryan. So, oh, one too many. <laughs> Uh, so the answer to the mayor's question is yes. Uh, so in 2018, we entered into an IGA with Phoenix to take uh, to address the issue of, of property south of Carefree Highway in, in the town jurisdiction. And uh, as part of that, we actually have a $600,000 obligation to pay for Phoenix for the infrastructure. Uh, we actually have a total of four reimbursement agreements in place. Uh, this is uh, um, one of the four. So I've brought three of them to you pr uh, previously. As you can see, Dutch Brothers is indicated in red. Uh, was resolution 2018-24. Uh, uh, I just want to highlight there is one more meter to pay for as part of the Sprouts development. Uh, uh, Council is probably aware that the, the big old tires is being developed there. So that's the last meter on that. So when we came forward with that reimbursement, it was for six of the seven meters on that site. So I'm still waiting to receive. They actually, as of yesterday, had not installed the meter in that box. So they haven't uh, worked out the arrangement with Phoenix and paid the fees for Phoenix. So once Phoenix does that, I will come back and that'll be the last reimbursement, the final one. Uh, but in total, uh, we've got the four. Once we're done, 
And so next year we pay the difference between what uh, has been paid out on these and what Phoenix is, is crediting us for. Uh, that number is built into our capital program. And right now it's $112,000 that we built into the capital program for next fiscal year that will uh, reconcile this. Next slide, Brian. Uh, so again, we've got the uh, agreement in place with um, um, uh, Cave Creek AZ. Cave Creek AZ Development Group was initial, but we actually have received a uh, document which shows that they did transfer the development right, uh, including uh, this reimbursement to Cave Creek Olson uh, DG LLC. So we're asking council just to uh, authorize this uh, payment to them and we can reconcile this. And then once I get the final one, I'll bring that forward and then also uh, reconcile in the capital program what we need to pay, what's owing at the end. So. Question from council. <laughs> Councilman so This one, this one. <laughs> Assuming Popeye's Louisiana chicken is built, mm. uh, will they be entitlement to a reimbursement under the IGA? No, uh, no, because there's no development grant reimbursement agreement okay. in place for them. Perfect. Yeah, they elected not to move forward with it, and and uh, they will actually will be getting a city of Phoenix meter directly, and they're just going to pay that fee. Perfect. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. So this will be the end of it. Yeah. Uh, let's see here. There is public comment on this. We have anybody? Okay, we're back to council for a motion, please. Yes, please, Vice Mayor. Okay. Read. Number seven. Motion to approve reimbursement, reimbursement of excess City of Phoenix water development fees to Cave Creek slash Olson DG LLC for APN 211-46-340A Dutch Brothers Coffee commercial development as indicated in section four fees of the IGA within City of Phoenix approved on November 28, 2018. Second. Comment? We don't pay we this. Owe this. We made a decision yeah. a long time ago to pay this. So uh, we don't pay this. It's going to do hell with our credit rating. <laughs> All right. Uh, this one. This one's financial as well. Council Member Diefenderfer. Yes. Council Member Sova. Yes. Council Member Royer. Yes. Council Member Morris. Yes. Council Member McGuire. Yes. Vice Mayor Smith. Yes. Mayor Bunch. Uh, yes, motion carries uh, seven zero. And now we will go back to number six. Did anyone have any questions on the presentation on the quarter, quarterly utility report? Uh, just one. Just one, please. How I have two mayors to run a service. I believe as of last week, I believe it was six. So as of this year's annual maintenance, uh, uh, the vendor we had, we had them all in service last year. Some of them uh, have gone back out of service. So we're working on getting those all back in service. That's our highest priority. It will be zero sometime. Yeah, it fluctuates. You know, every time we go out, some of them are out of service. So yeah, you know, it lessens every year. But as a priority for us. Any other questions from council? Yes, sir. <laughs> Councilman Sofa. Sean, has the town ever looked at the possibility of when we have excess effluent that would, you know, instead of just throwing it away, talk to the people across the street in Phoenix at Dove Valley Golf Club? to see if they could use it or, uh, you know, it's down, it's, it's, it goes downhill. So it'd be gravity fed. It's a short run, depending on where you could put in a pond or is that all tied up with Phoenix? Uh, I think we'd have to have that conversation with Phoenix first because it would be part of their service area. So we'd be providing water in their service area, but I'm not sure if they'd be completely averse to that, you know, it's something we can do. Um, yeah, you know, I'd like to look at all the options available to us um, for, you know, uh, to get beneficial use out of that water. Uh, again, if we have the contract with Rancho Mignon, obviously we've got an efficiency in the lake system, but it, it just it really uh, irks me the fact that we know how much water is being going over a, a, a weir and going down a wash that we get no benefit from. And then my last you know, question is, is the town working on the sewer smell on the top of the hill on Cave Creek by Mountain View Pub. It's been ongoing. I, I know there's been work up there and your crews have been trying, but it still exists. Oh, okay. You know, I haven't, I haven't heard anything directly about it. We actually had an issue a few months ago. What actually happened is we had an odor tray, um, a charcoal old tray in one of the sewer uh, manholes that actually had fallen down actually was holding back flow. That was the last time. So that's been a few months ago. Um, you know, we'll go out there and investigate more. 
it, it's hard because of the top end of the system. And uh, the, I think we have some issues. It goes down quick down there uh, when you get going towards the east or sorry, the west. west. But I think we're at the top there. We do want to investigate. There's a, a connection to San Sui. That's over 300 feet. It's a lateral. And I want to get that video camera to find out if there's any bellies in that and, and figure it all out. But yeah, that's something it's part of the collection assessment. I'd like to talk to GHD about recommendations up there. That might be a spot that we have to do uh, chemical injections long-term to get a solution in place. Yeah. Don't we have the apartments going in there that are going to tie into the top of the line? Uh, yes, right now the apartments are planning to tie into that same manhole. Which, 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 which if the line will handle the volume, it will really help that by diluting with the residential as opposed to the, all the commercial stuff that's in yeah, there. Yeah, getting a little bit more flow at the top end will help it. You know, yeah. In the past, the, the, the staff were just pushing water down it. You yeah. know, you really should jet it out. We actually did have the line jetted, jetted out about four months ago. So, but now hearing this first time I've heard did, that we've got a problem. Did you find the right angle turn in front of Harold's? Uh, we should actually stop before that. <laughs> There's, huh? Before that? Yeah. Yeah. yeah they, a, they, they didn't know where the right of way was when they were digging the trench and they got down and they went, Oh, we need to move this over. They made a right angle in a, in a four inch sewer line or six <laughs> inch, four inch or six inch. I think it's an eight at that point. Eight. Okay. Yeah. 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 So. yeah. <clears throat> in, yeah, we have really some interesting smart. manholes in our collection system. <laughs> Do we have a motion to adjourn? So moved. All right. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you, Thank you, uh, Council.